Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you in this series of webinars organized in collaboration with the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, the Mediterranean Association of Neurosurgical Societies, and the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies as well. This is part of the 100 uh, webinar project. Uh, it was initiated uh, with beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our first webinar was organized 29th May 2020. We already organized 67 webinars. Many of them are educational symposia. Today's webinar 68, it's another WFNS educational symposia. I'm glad to work with Professor Louis Borba, Chairman of the Education and Training Committee of the WFNS. Today we address an important subject, which is intracranial meningioma part two. First of all, let me all welcome all our distinguished speakers. I will go by the order by which they speak. Uh, James Louis Liu from USA, Vladimir Binis from Czech Republic, Mishihiro Kono from Japan, Mario Amirati from USA, Vincenzo Esposito from Italy, Thomas Centelius from UK, Jose Alberto Landiero from Brazil, Gerardo Giuinto from Mexico, Ajith Nair from India, Mahdi Darmour from Tunisia, and finally Hisham Basuni from Germany. Thanks to all of you for contributing to this neurosurgical activity and for giving us much of your time, sharing your knowledge and experience with neurosurgeons across the globe is well appreciated. Let me welcome our distinguished moderators. Thank you very much for moderating the sessions in this webinar. Andrew Grotenhaus, Netherlands, Alberto Dell'Italia, Italy, and Alistair Jenkins from UK. As you can see over the screen, our uh, program today is very interesting. It is uh, divided into three sessions. We are organizing the Intracranial Meningiomas Part 2 after the great success uh, in the Intracranial Meningioma Part 1. And uh, according to requests uh, we received from many participants. Uh, I'm glad to tell you that until yesterday, we had 700 registrants over Zoom, as we can see over the screen. To all attendees, we are glad to get all questions and comments. It will be monitored by the moderators through the chat panel or the Q&A. This is the certificate which will be sent to you. Remind you that this, uh, event is recognized by the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, and this certificate is approved by the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. In order to receive your certificate, please, you have to participate in the webinar from the beginning to the end. We are organizing our webinar series either with the Education and Training Committee of the WFNS, sometimes with scientific committees of the WFNS, with neurosurgical societies, whether national, regional, or continental, and sometimes with well-known universities. The maximum capacity of each webinar is 500 registrants. However, in some webinars, the local organizing committee extends the capacity and open registration again for a limited time. This table shows the last 10 webinars. As we can see, the maximum participation occurs in the WFNS educational activities. If we take last webinar as example, we had 1,054 uh, uh, registrants. Not all the registrants participate. Uh, only out of uh, this 1,054, 491 participated, uh, and not only uh, not all of them received certificates. Only 230 participants received the certificates for participation. Those who participated more than three hours. Um, our webinar series is also available over the YouTube channel. This is the QR code if you like to scan it, but remind you that all, not all the webinar are going to be available over the YouTube. This is according to the decision of the organizing committee again. We relaunched the Pan Arab Journal of Neurosurgery. This is the QR code. I'm glad to be editor in chief of this journal. Please submit your articles, both submission, both submission and uh, Publication is free. Our next webinar takes place next Friday, webinar 69, another collaboration with the WFNS, Neurotraumatology Committee with Andre Robiano. We have 
a galaxy of eminent speakers from all continents. Webinar number 70 takes place Friday, 17th March. It's a collaboration with the International Academy of Spine. We are going to collaborate with Oscar Alves. Again, uh, we are addressing a very important subject, which is craniovertebral junction anomalies. Webinar 71, Friday, 31st March, 2023, a collaboration with the craniovertebral junction and spine society. I'm happy and glad to work with Professor Atul Guel. Again, we have another galaxy of eminent speakers from all over the world. We are working almost every Friday at 12 p.m. GMT or 2 p.m. Egypt time. I'm glad also that we are, uh, we are organizing the 14th Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons Congress, which takes place in Egypt uh, from 28 to 30 November 2024. I'm glad to be president of this Congress. I'm also glad to work with Professor Yoko Kato, who is president of the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. All of you are invited. I think it will be a good opportunity to visit together the Grand Egyptian Museum. Thank you very much for attention. I give the mic to Professor Luis Borba to say his welcome note, and then Professor Alberto de Letala, who is representing uh, the Mediterranean Association of Neurological Associations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Algondur. Thank you, all of you. Good morning, good evening, the people from the five continents. I'd like to thank all the speakers, all the moderators, and the people who really make this seminar is a great. You know, it's very easy to go to the top. In the education, this webinar series that is going around, it's very easy to get people. However, it's extremely difficult to stay in the top. In this work that Professor Algandur is doing these years, make how good it is. In these 70 webinars that he organized, now is very well known and accepted in the whole world. Do you know? Because the quality of the speakers, the quality of the moderator, and the great work of Professor Gondu is doing. Meningioma is a passion to all the neurosurgeons. Meningioma is our dream. Meningioma is the thing that many of us became neurosurgeons. Today, the way that we are seeing meningioma in the world is a little bit different. But the way that you are going, we're not sure that is the best way for you come back to the old time. Meningioma treatment is changing. The philosophy is changing. We are understanding the disease. In this webinar, the first one that didn't finish yet, and the second that is coming here, and probably you have the third, because the people want to discuss about meningioma. Thank you, all of you, the speakers, the moderators, especially to Professor Algandur, to the give to the people to the five continents the opportunity to keep updated in every topic. Thank you, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I, I give the mic to Professor uh, uh, Alitalia to, 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 to continue. Thank you again. Hello, uh, thanks uh, to everybody to be here, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, and uh, particularly thanks to Nasser, uh, uh, whose energy is uh, always uh, is always active, very active and very strong. It's really a pleasure to meet uh, uh, many many friends and many colleagues uh, like you are. Um, I want to uh, underline that uh, meningiomas, uh, uh, meningioma is a, 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 an issue, a very important issue for uh, neurosurgeons, uh, but also for, uh, for uh, biological uh, research and for uh, the contribution uh, that uh, uh, radiotherapy and radiosurgery can give uh, to, to the treatment of them. Uh, we usually think that uh, we know very well uh, meningiomas, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, many, many uh, questions are still open. 
so I'm uh, very glad to to meet uh, this uh, expert panel and thank you for uh, all uh, contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We give the mic back to Professor Andrew Grotenhaus, uh, who is going to moderate the first session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Nasser. And uh, again, um, thank you for inviting me to be part of the um, this webinar. Uh, it is a great work that you did. And um, I can also see that you thoroughly enjoy doing it. Uh, we start uh, right away, and um, it is uh, James Liu who will um, uh, start off this webinar with his lecture on falcotatorial meningiomas. Please, James, share the screen. Yes, I will share my screen. Um... Yeah, we can see it and go to presentation mode. Perfect. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, good morning or good evening in some parts of the world. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Gondor and Professor Borba for organizing this very important educational global event. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and speak to you and to be with my esteemed colleagues here. Today, I'm going to speak about falcotentorial meningiomas. These are uh, incredibly challenging and incredibly rare. These are comprise roughly less than 1% of all meningioma types. Although as neurosurgeons, we frequently see meningiomas. When we see meningiomas in this location, uh, they present a, a technical challenge, largely due to the deep location and the location around the brainstem, which can sometimes cause obstructive hydrocephalus, ataxia, visual changes, and more importantly, it's the uh, involvement of the deep venous structures. So when we look at the anatomy and we look at Roten's dissections, uh, beautiful uh, work, you can see that the falx meets the tentorium deep in the brain, just behind the corpus callosum and behind the brainstem here. And the deep veins, namely the internal cerebral veins, and uh, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the inferior sagittal sinus, the internal cerebral veins coming out of the third ventricle, join to meet the vein of Galen, which then drains into that falcotentorial junction and down the straight sinus to the torcula. So when the tumors attach here, injury to the venous structure can be quite uh, morbid. So it's important to really study your preoperative imaging. I often use a CTA or a CTV to look for the deep venous structures. And here you can see the internal cerebral vein is on the deep side of the tumor. Uh, and this will help you determine which is the safest avenue and approach. Again, you can see uh, the important critical structures of the region of the falcon tutorial yeah. junction just behind the midbrain and brainstem. And uh, here's an illustration depicting again, what can be some challenges that present you, particularly in this case, when the tumor is on the opposite side of the vein of Galen and deep venous structures. So we must preserve these venous structures. Uh, venous infarction in these deep cerebral veins can uh, result in significant morbidity and even death. Um, so remember this uh, uh, anatomy. You're going to be uh, in between the cerebellum and the occipital lobes, parietal lobes, corpus callosum, posterior third ventricle, and brainstem uh, in the deep region here. This is a view of a uh, Supra cerebellar infratentorial uh, endoscopic view uh, in a cadaver. You can see coming from the supra cerebellar route, the vein of Galen is above you. And um, these are various uh, articles demonstrating uh, different classifications and different uh, ways of approaching uh, falcotentorial meningiomas. I'll just uh, point these out uh, as references. You can go back and look. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the Basuni classification, uh, who will actually be speaking later today. 
but it's basically uh, describing the origin of the tumor relative to the venous structures to help determine your optimal approach. There's different ways to get to the falcotentorial region, anterior inner hemispheric, interparietal inner hemispheric, occipital transtentorial, and uh, supracerebellar infratentorial approach. And um, we oftentimes will have to disconnect the falcs and then even cut the tentorium to access these tumors and to free up uh, the attachments. But again, you have to know where the vein of Galen is, the internal cerebral veins, and you don't want to violate these venous structures. Uh, this is a paper um, uh, we published not too long ago on the interhemispheric precuneous retrosplenial transfalcine approach. And um, this is the approach that I tend to favor. Um, it, um, this is a case example when you come in uh, from the precuneal approach. This was a gentleman who had a falcotentorial meningioma in 2012 that grew in 2015. You can see it's much larger, causing a neural compression of the adjacent structures. Uh, what's interesting is it's asymmetric, and you see how the tumor on the right side is higher than the left side. So this presents an interesting question on how to position the patient and which side to come in from as the most optimal. So we studied the venogram, and you could see the internal cerebral veins are on the ventral side. So in my opinion, coming in supracerebellar, infratentorial is not optimal. The vein of Galen would be in your way. You would have a long reach to the tumor. But the safer route is to come from above, not from a occipital transtentorial route, but from a higher interparietal retrocolossal precuneal route, interhemispheric, you could see you have wide access to the tumor and the deep veins on the, are on your opposite side of the tumor. So we will uh, position the patient lateral, which will allow gravity assistance. And I'm going to put the, the taller tumor on the opposite side. So that'll be on the superior side. So the right side is on the top, the left side is down. I uh, bend the uh, neck laterally so that the falc cerebri is roughly 20 degrees from the horizontal, from the floor. Uh, we use a linear incision in this case, and uh, I'd like to take the craniotomy across the midline. And this is important because uh, you can then retract the uh, sagittal sinus by an additional few millimeters and that, those few millimeters uh, give you excellent view of the tumor. Uh, you can use a, a, a retractor to elevate the falcs to give you extra light and extra room. And you could see this is a typical picture, hypervascularity of the falcs. We're now working interhemispheric. Um, we'll start with debulking of the tumor after devascularizing uh, the surface. And once the tumor is debulked, we can start to come around the tumor in an extracapsular fashion and begin to uh, carefully coagulate and peel the tumor from the neural structure. So here is the splenium of the corpus callosum. There's the tumor. And we'll put a little cotton patty to hold our retrocolosal corridor. And once we've uh, defined our margins, We'll then cut the falcs. Uh, I'll often use a Doppler to map out the inferior sagittal sinus. But the, opening the falcs now creates a bi-hemispheric corridor. So now you can work cross court and go to the opposite side. Now this is the side where the tumor is going to be taller. And so I chose the right side to be on the top side so that I can bring the tumor down. So there's the splenium of the corpus callosum. It's got a nice peel arachnoid plane. We can uh, carefully peel away from the corpus callosum and eventually the brainstem will be on the, the opposite side here. 
So on the posterior side, you have to be more careful because that's where the falco-tentorial junction is. And look, there's the vein of Galen. This is the falx where it meets the tentorium. So you have to be careful back here. Uh, and if you're not careful and you injure the vein of Galen, uh, your operation is ga game over. So be mindful. My policy is if I see any tumor adherence to any deep venous structures, uh, I will trim the tumor and leave small residue, uh, the least amount possible on the venous structures, uh, and then treat it with radio surgery afterwards. So this is the opposite side. See how I can now bring the tumor down. This is the taller side of the tumor. I can bring the tumor down, carefully dissect it from the contralateral hemisphere and uh, protect the, the, the patty. Now the tumor is large, so uh, it's important to just debulk it in a piecemeal fashion. There's no need to be heroic and try to, to, to deliver a large piece of tumor uh, so as to not uh, uh, avulse any uh, important neurovascular structures on your blind side. So cut the tumor in small pieces and then work your way down until you get to the valcotentorial junction. So you wanna have a lot of space, a lot of room. And here's the falcotentorial junction. You can see uh, it looks very similar to the rotin dissection here uh, in this triangulated uh, delta of uh, venous structure. There's some tumor here, but I know this is getting close, getting close to the uh, important part. So uh, I leave uh, a microscopic residue there. But here is the endoscopic view. I like to use an endoscope to look around the corners, look on the opposite side to check if I missed anything but you can see a beautiful view. Here's the falcotentorial junction with some tumor invasion into the straight sinus uh, and vein of Galen region. So, so here's the post-op scan. Uh, I think a very uh, meaningful resection. Uh, there was some microscopic residue here that I ended up treating with uh, radiosurgery. And uh, here he is post-op immediately and uh, in the outpatient setting. This is a 64-year-old female with occipital pressure. Uh, you can see another large tumor, uh, a little bit more narrow this time. But the venous structure here is uh, a bit confusing. It's really, it was hard for me to see where the internal cerebral veins were. Uh, but it turns out that uh, the veins were on the bottom side and they were collapsed by the pressure of the tumor. This is the inferior sagittal sinus. We did a formal angiogram, which confirmed the same thing. Uh, in this case, I used a linear incision, and I've converted to a linear incision just because it gives me a little bit wider exposure and it heals just nicely. Again, we take the bone flap across the midline. Uh, we start interhemispherically, and sometimes you have these adhesions that you have to lyse to get into the interhemispheric fissure. Again, hypervascular tumor arising from the falx. We'll devascularize the tumor and then start the debulking with an ultrasonic aspirator. And I've mapped out the inferior sagittal sinus. I'm going to cut the uh, falx, coagulate the falx. There's the uh, straight sinus, and the tentorium is here. So using a Doppler is very useful. So in this case, we're going to cut the uh, tentorium and the falx. So here is the contralateral side, contralateral side of the tumor. Some tumor debulking. And uh, there was some bleeding here from the inferior sagittal sinus. You could just gently pack that off. And then this is the critical part. We're starting to see some tumor adhesions here on the back side, And this is the side where the vein of Galen was compressed. And it was actually stuck inside the tumor capsule. And oftentimes I see people when they do meningioma surgery, they use a lot of bipolar and they bipolar the capsule frequently. In this case, if you did that, you would have violated and occluded the vein of Galen and internal cerebral veins that was adherent uh, to the tumor. And so here we are, there's the 
one branch of the deep vein going into the vein of Galen, but you see how it's very adherent and uh, we're just carefully using sharp dissection to dissect away. Here's another deep vein on the bottom ventral side of the tumor, a lot of adhesions. And so carefully manipulate. So you can see this is the deep vein here going all the way up to Galen. Look at this um, strict adherence. I had to leave this little microscopic remnant here right on the wall of the vein. Uh, it's important to better to preserve the vein uh, than to try to be heroic and get a complete removal. But this is the vein. Look at the course of the vein. This was in the capsule of the tumor. I was able to dissect it out. A little bit of microscopic here. I'm not too concerned. Overall, I think uh, a meaningful uh, resection. And then there's the opposite side of the Falks. And here's the post-op scan. Look at the CT angiogram after. This is the vein of Galen. I'm sorry, the internal cerebral vein. You can see it was on the inferior side as predicted. And it is now filling because it was previously compressed. And here's the post-operative scan. Uh, she did very well and was neurologically intact. Now, this example is a uh, tentorial meningioma that grew into the falco-tentorial junction. Now, this is an important variant because these tumors are originating slightly lateral to the falco-tentorial junction. And the reason why I say that's important, because uh, this will help you determine the, the side of approach. So if you're going to do this tumor in a lateral position, do you position the patient right side down or the left side down? So contra, in contradistinction to my previous principle where I said put the larger side on the top side, in this case, I would suggest putting the larger side on the inferior side because this tumor is arising from the tentorium, and it will be easier to see the tentorial notch on the ipsilateral side than on the contralateral side. And you'll understand this when I show you the video. This is the stealth planning showing our working corridors. Again, you see the same uh, uh, thing. One thing I forgot to mention is oftentimes these patients present with hydrocephalus. So I'll put the ventricular drain after the craniotomy using image guidance, and that releases the CSF so that you get enough brain relaxation to get down into this interhemispheric fissure. And then again, we're uh, um, doing the same uh, maneuvers, debulking. And then because this is on the tentorium side, it's gonna be stuck to the tentorium. So you have to bring the tumor up into the field now. So after adequate debulking, we deliver the tumor up into our field. We can put some cotinoid patties to boost the tumor into our corridor to make it easier to work. And then you can see this, this tumor had a very nice arachnoid plane where you can peel the arachnoid membranes off of the tumor capsule, bring them to the side of the, the neurovascular structures and, um, and dissect. Now, the, the vein of Galen here and the internal cerebral vein is on the top side. So this is the tentorium. And here's the final. Uh, no, it is, it's the telephone of uh, Professor Amirati that is sometimes uh, um, beeping. Yeah, if we can have him oh. muted, that would, that would be helpful. So here's the endoscopic view. And I want to show you the deep vein. This is the vein of Galen, which was on the underside of that tentorium. So it was important to carefully dissect it away and you have a beautiful view of the uh, back of the brain stem and the posterior uh, third ventricle. There's the trochlear nerve that was entering the tentorium, which was preserved. And um, this is the uh, post-operative scan. This was a complete removal, uh, uh, very satisfying, and he was neurologically intact. Now, this patient um, has a pineal region meningioma. She had a prior tentorial meningioma resected many years ago by another surgeon, but look where it recurred. It recurred in here. It's not attached to any dura. It's probably a vellum interpositum meningioma, which can, 
have arachnoid capsules and, and arise meningiomas in this region without attachment to any faults or tentorium. Uh, but uh, this is a tumor a recurrence. Now, if a tumor is dark on T2, it's very firm. It's possibly uh, very fibrous or even calcified. The veins are on the top. So in this case, instead of coming uh, in a higher trajectory, we came from a little bit lower occipital transtentorial trajectory. And um, this is the final view. It was very uh, fibrous, but uh, we had to do a lot of debulking. And um, eventually, this is just a quarter of the tumor at the end, uh, although it appears large. This is actually after uh, a lot of adequate uh, debulking. So it's important to uh, debulk these tumors and um, you know, ensure that it's free from any kind of uh, venous structure attachment before you remove it. And there's, there's the deep uh, internal cerebral vein here over the top. And then there's the beautiful view. This is the view of the posterior third ventricle. And here's the postoperative scan, vellum interpositum. Um, this approach is one, one I did early on in my, my evolution of trying to understand these tumors. Uh, but this is the approach that Professor Shekhar had described, coming in from both corridors combined by occipital, and then you could divide the transverse sinus after you do a clip test and you measure the pressure uh, uh, in this way. Th th this is an approach I probably um, won't do uh, anymore because uh, I think you can really get to this through the interparietal approach, uh, but it is one of the approaches described in the literature that you can consider. This was, a, a, again, a very uh, wide tumor and um, all the different approaches to be considered. Um, so in this case, I just show you this for academic purposes. Uh, this is how you expose it. It's a wide bioccipital, suboccipital exposure. Uh, I take the bone flap in uh, two different pieces to preserve the sinuses. And then you do a clip test. You can clip the transverse sinus and then measure it, measure the pressure and measure the SSEP to make sure there's no change in the pressure. If there's no change in the pressure after a five minute clamp time, you can uh, transect the transverse sinus to get added exposure to get this supra and infra tentorial uh, exposure. And, um, So here is the, uh, the clip on the transverse sinus. We cut the transverse sinus, and then you get the tumor exposure here. And then the tumor debulking is, is very same as before. Extra capsular dissection. This is the brain stem, peeling the tumor off of the brain stem. There's the trochlear nerve right in the back of the brainstem, make sure you look for those trochlear nerves and preserve them. And of course, preserve the deep veins. There's the vein of Rosenthal. And as we're getting anterior to it, there's the internal cerebral veins, there's the vein of Galen, and there's tumor adherence. I couldn't get it off, so I trimmed it. I left a little bit on the vein of Galen junction. And then this is the EVD catheter. The patient had pre-existing hydrocephalus. You could see there's the catheter. And then there's the deep uh, venous structures. And then a uh, final view here. And so here's the post-op scan. Uh, she did well, uh, was neurologically intact. But I, I think I can get all this through the interparietal approach I showed you before. Uh, but this was a case uh, early on in my career. Uh, but uh, again, a, a very nice result. So I'll conclude here that falcotentorial meningiomas can be accessed interhemispherically in the lateral position. You should choose the corridor that aligns with the long axis of the tumor in the sagittal plane. Study the venous anatomy. It's very important. You must preserve the deep venous anatomy to avoid complications. And endoscopic inspection uh, after the resection, I think, is very useful. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, I think Dr. Leo beautifully demonstrated the um, um, the anatomy around that. And it also emphasized what I 
always told my residents the difference between operating on a meningioma in the supracellar area and in this region, in the supracellar area, it's arterial surgery. In this area, it is venous surgery. And that is much more tricky. The vein, veins are less forgiven. So this is, um, that's the main difference. Otherwise, anatomically, uh, it's, it's a similar beautiful area that we can deal with. But uh, you clearly showed that, how important it is to preserve those veins. Absolutely. I don't, let's see, there just popped up one question. Maybe it is, um, no, it is only people saying uh, uh, greetings. That's all. No, there's no questions in the questions and, and answers. I would say that people use the chat for greetings and not the question and answers, because otherwise, as moderator, it's difficult to know if it is a question to the uh, to the speaker. But there is one from Thomas Santarius. Hi, Tom. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I was really enjoyed the um, talk by Dr. Liu. Um, and um, I was uh, I think his surgery and also um, practical tips were, were very good. Um, I have to say, you know, I have no comment apart from um, saying that I would do pretty much everything um, the, the way he did if I, if, if I was doing it, um, another case like this. But perhaps one thing that, um, particularly for the trainees, they, they may be, they not, not be completely um, aware of that. I think particularly when we operate in this area, uh, venous, I mean, with the meningiomas in general, but uh, particularly in this area, any sort of venous capital, in my opinion, should be absolutely preserved. And, uh, and Dr. Liu himself said that he would not necessarily do that, um, which, which is dividing transverse sinus. Mm. I have to say, certainly, I, I would absolutely never do that uh, for a a lesion in the for facal tentorial meningioma located around the incisura. I mean, there are some tumors that perhaps would invade and completely obliterate transverse sinus, but uh, purely for access, um, every little bit of venous outflow um, from this area needs to be saved and preserved. And and for tumors like that, we we can get that uh, in, through various means without dividing the transverse sinus. I, I agree. I, I that's that's an approach I used only one time early in my career, but since I evolved, I I've shied away from it. But uh, I wanted to show it for academic purposes. Yeah. I deliberately highlighted it because I think um, it, it, this you know it's one of those things where we we take the veins and and many times we get away with it, but in in some cases this can be the crucial amount of venous outflow that the patient needs to survive. Absolutely. Okay, James. Maybe if there are other <laughs> questions in the, in the questions, Professor. you can uh, you can answer that uh, by yourself by writing the answers because of the time we need to. Move on, uh, but oh, no. Professor, may, okay. May I make one very short question? Please. Maybe to you, maybe to you and and, and, to, and to Thomas, and that there are more scientists than us. <laughs> Why parasagital meningioma has a lot of atypical features, and falcotentorial meningioma two centimeters back has not. Looks like a different tumor. The tumor is, 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 is large, but biologically are different. There is some explanation for that? Yeah, it's a good, very good question. I mean, <laughs> we there's no direct explanation to it, but um, in um, about 10 years ago, papers started coming out showing that there is different um, biological and molecular underpinning of tumors arising from different areas of the brain. So although they are all meningiomas, not all meningiomas are the same. And, and particularly so the convexity and some um, parasagittal um, meningiomas, um, for example, are, are of different makeup 
they contain more likely than meningiomas, for example, on anterior skull base, NF2 mutations. And, and generally, they, um, they are more likely to be atypical and uh, anaplastic. So that there is there is something uh, clearly either embryological that that would be my guess that under underpins the propensity for certain um, uh, sort of biological behavior. Yeah, yeah, because it's two centimeters back. <laughs> it's completely different. Yeah, the polysagittal yeah. has yeah. more atypical feature than the falcotentorium. Yeah, now amazingly, we know very little about the development of meningiomas. Usually we quote papers from the sort of early 20th century as if it was a gospel. But, um, I, you know, one of my friends in Oxford is currently studying uh, and, and also here in Cambridge, development of meninges and so on. But um, so hopefully in the next few years, um, we will know much more about it and, and we'll be able to answer your question. Thank you, Tom. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure now, Nasser, I see so many hands up of people that um, I'm not in the questions. I think we have to move on because of the time. Um, there was a lot of time, but Professor Binish still has difficulty uh, joining online. So we would ask to, uh, Professor Michihiro Kono uh, to give his lecture on surgery of cerebellar pontine angle meningioma. Can you share your screen? Okay. Yes, we can see it. Can I see? Yes, it is perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your invitation, uh, Nassau. Uh, it's my great honor to be here, and I'll talk about surgery for CP angle meningiomas. Uh, about the COI, there's nothing. Before starting my presentation, I'd like to introduce myself and our institute shortly. I'm a chairman of Department of Neurosurgery, uh, Tokyo Medical University, Tokyo, Japan. I'm a skull based surgeon and uh, once active member and WFNS, educational course faculty member. I used to be a disciple of Professor Eiji Sano and Professor Tomio Sasaki. At the skull based center of Tokyo Medical University Hospital, we perform surgery for CPN tumors two or four cases per week, totally about 150 cases per year. My personal experience of surgery for CP and tumor is like this. So CP and skull based meningiomas. As you know, there are various surgical approaches for CP and tumors. I have been selecting uh, these approaches uh, for more than 25 years. Uh, for meningiomas, I approached from three di directions, like uh, lateral sigmoid, combined transpetrosal, and anterior transpetrosal approach, like this. For petrochrybal or petrotentorial meningiomas, I used uh, combined transpetrosal approach most frequently. For tentorial meningiomas, I uh, selected uh, anterior transpetals approach uh, mainly. And for the other types of uh, meningiomas, uh, I use the lateral sigmoid approach. Uh, totally uh, like this. When the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves locate ventral, rostral, or caudal, to the tumor without Meckel's cave extension. I use the lateral sigmoid approach like vestibular schwannoma surgery. For jugulophramen meningiomas, I sometimes uh, add supra approach to uh, lateral sigmoid approach. In this case, uh, tumor extended into the jugulophramen and internal auditory canal. 
internal auditor canal extension and uh, jugular foramen uh, extension. On right side, we can see the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves rostrally. I found the lower cranial nerves here. <clears throat> After taking the cisternal part of the tumor, I'm opening the internal auditory canal and upper jugular foramen, like this. I'm taking the metal part <clears throat> of the tumor. We can see seventh and eighth cranial nerves here. And I also taking the uh, foraminal part of the tumor. The tumor was totally removed. We can see the sixth nerve. Tumor is totally removed. And this is the uh, area of bony drilling and preoperative hearing disturbance improved the normal condition. When the seventh and the eighth uh, land dorsal to the small tumor located rostrally to the ISC or Meckel's cave extension are the good candidates for anterior transpetals approach. Left side. I'm drawing the Kawasaki triangle. I'm ligating the super petrosa sinus and cutting the tentorium. Fourth nerve is here. Fifth nerve is here. After taking the cisternal part, I'm opening the internal auditory canal from rostrally. I took the metal part of the tumor. We can see the basilar and the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves. For petrocribal or petrotentorial meningiomas, I use the combined transpetals approach, leaving the semicircular canals. Left side, I'm doing a mastoidectomy. And I'm thinning the covering bone of the sigmoid sinus like this quickly. Sigmoid sinus and the semicircular canals. I'm cutting the uh, middle fossa dura and also the tentorium. We can see the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves here. Fourth nerve is here, fifth nerve is here. And I'm opening the ISC. And we can see the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves here. Basal artery, sixth nerve, fourth nerve, third nerve, pituitary stock. This is the final view. Tumor was nearly totally removed. In this case of the, the left petrocribal meningioma with dangerous venous pattern for middle cranial force approach like this. Uh, in this case, we need the combined transpetals approach, but to preserve venous drainage, I selected the modified anterior transpetals approach with uh, mastoidectomy. This approach was uh, reported from Keio University and this is the standard anterotranspetrosal approach, extra dura approach. This is the modification uh, with the subdural and epidural approach. Left side, mastoidectomy first, and cutting the middle fossa dura. And this is the 
Venus systems, what I wanted to preserve, and I cut the posterior half of the dura, and I'm doing a uh, calluses approach in the uh, extra dura area. Uh, Subdural area is here. And this is the venous system. After ligating the SPS, cutting the tentolium, I'm elevating the tumor. Fifth nerve is here. Third nerve is here. The tumor was nearly totally removed successfully. When we cut the SPS, we should care about the venous drainage in meningioma surgery. Uh, we, we cut SPS, not here, but here, to preserve uh, venous drain, drainage through the petrosal uh, vein uh, toward the posteriorly. This method was uh, reported from uh, Osaka City University Group. It's not an meningioma case, uh, epidermal cyst case, combined transpetals approach. Mastoid emissary vein is here. We can see the GSPN here. Anterior transpetals approach now. We should remove this area. Uh, to enlarge the surgical field. This is the endolymphatic sac. After that, I'm cutting the posterior fossa dura, uh, preserving the, the endolymphatic sac. And I'm looking for the petrosa vein, and I found it. So I'm ligating uh, the, the SPS ventrally to the entry point of the petrosal vein. Fourth nerve is here. Seventh and eighth cranial nerve is here. We can see the sixth nerve, sixth wall, fourth nerve, third nerve. And finally, I open the Meckel's cave. Tumor was totally removed. Post operative course was uneventful. About the monitoring, uh, we use real time continuous facial monitoring in vestibular schwannoma surgery. I converted uh, this method into the jugular foramen meningiomas, jugular foramen tumors, including meningiomas. We published it. And in this case, uh, I used the continuous abducens nerve monitoring in the uh, light uh, Peter Kreiber meningioma. Right side, anterior transpetals approach now. Cutting the middle fossa and posterior fossa dura, and I'm ligating the SPS. Cutting the tentolium, we can see the fifth nerve and the uh, fourth nerve. I'm opening the Meckel's cave and uh, moving the uh, trigeminal nerve, and I'm uh, searching for the uh, feeders from the meaning a hypophysial trunk and I found it. And I electrocoagulated it and cut it. Fourth nerve is here. Sixth nerve here. I got the response from this nerve. So I started the continuous abducens nerve monitoring. Under the continuous monitoring, I am taking the tumor. Basal artery. 
I am putting down the uh, supra uh, tentorial part here. And we can see the free ten tentorial free edge and the third nerve here. Fourth nerve, basal artery. Fifth nerve. And the sixth nerve. Prevention of CSF leak is very important. Like this. I left a tumor inside the drill canal uh, without any abducens nerve policy. In summary, uh, incipient and scurvous meningioma surgery, selecting an appropriate surgical approach is very important. Using an interoperative real-time continuous monitoring is useful to increase the tumor excision rate while avoiding severe post-operative cranial policies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kono. Sorry that there was a noise in between because one of the participants who is now in the panel, Mrs. Yasmina Bujilud, was not muted and therefore all the noise came in between. That was very disturbing. Uh, but the beautiful overview of those, let's say, three uh, main approaches that we have to CP angle meningioma. Um, do you agree that, it, or how do you look to where the meningioma originates, because usually the, the origin of the meningioma is that will what will decide um, how to approach it. Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm very sorry. Mrs. Yasmina Bujalut, could you please, you have raised your hand, but could you please mute yourself at this time? Please, could you mute yourself? Okay. Well, that's, Nasser, this is one of the difficulties if you let the participants in join the panel, but they did, don't respond. Um, it was very disturbing for, um, uh, for the audience um, during the lecture of uh, Professor Kono. Yes, uh, please. So, uh, yes. I think very important and the relationship between the uh, tumor and the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves. So uh, we don't uh, want to take the tumor beyond the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves. So that's why I approach uh, from the other side of, from, of the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves. That's the key uh, of my selection approach. Yes, that is, you don't want to first see all the nerves and then that meningioma in front of it, which makes it much more difficult. There's a question, James, Professor Liu, please. Oh, yes, uh, Michihiro, thank you for that beautiful talk and beautiful videos. Uh, my question is, I, I agree with your concepts and approaches, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of anterior patrosal. When we have a meningioma that extends to the IAC, <laughs> Sometimes for me, I'm, sometimes it's difficult for me to decide whether to come retrosigmoid supramietal or anterior patrosal uh, be, because of the, the location of the IAC extension. Sometimes it's on the superior, sometimes it's very anterior, sometimes it's on the posterior side. Um, so I wanted to know your thoughts on when you see IAC extension, which approach are you choosing from, from the front or from the back? But uh, so I think, uh, can you, can you uh, see, pre-see pre the uh, condition of the uh, petrosal vein? No. So uh, that's why I, I don't do a uh, supramental approach because we can't calculate. So, and uh, that's why I, I do, I will do the anterior transvetral approach. We don't have to worry about the vein, uh, so petrosal vein. There is a question uh, from uh, the, the Q&A. Um, do you, 
take help from an ENT colleague to drill the petrosal area. Uh, you're no. doing it yourself. By, by myself. By myself. I mean, it, it, it needs training. You need you need really to do this frequently in the lab, but of course it is not necessary. But I know that many neurosurgeons ask the ENT surgeons to do that. But mm, you, I know. Don't do mm. Okay. And the other one is, do you sometimes leave tumor behind when it is adherent to the brain stem? Yes. Uh, Wait. Mm -hmm. About meningioma, uh, so, uh, so meningioma is uh, very so dif difficult to uh, so, uh, dis dissect the ad adhesion uh, between the tumor and the brain stem. Uh, vestio schwannoma uh, is very easy, I think, quite different. So uh, I I don't do uh, total re total removal every time about the brainstem uh, adhesion. And now I see still three hands raised, and I start um, the first that I see is Ali Bayati. Are you present to ask your question? You raised your hand. Okay, and there's no reaction to it. Uh, then there is somebody who identifies as one plus Nord two five G, probably his um, his iPhone. So we don't know who you are, but you raised your hand. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. And then I. Finally, we'll ask then uh, Mrs. Yasmina Bujelut. You also raised your, raised your hand. You now can unmute yourself and ask the <laughs> question. No, those, so those three raised hands are not there. There was one more question, but I think it's a general question to uh, the two speakers of uh, Mr. Maja Ali, who wants to know if meningiomas only involve meningeal layers or if there is any other structure in the brain where meningiomas can originate. So that's a more general question. Anyone volunteer? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it is the meningeal layers, he will mean, of course, the, it's the arachnoid, arachnoid cells are also present uh, in between the choroid plexus. So sometimes you see indeed interventricular meningiomas appearing at the choroid plexus, but if you see it histologically, um, they, are, they are arachnoid cells. And yes, sometimes there is, um, I published a meningioma that was originating from the pituitary stalk and had no other um, connection to any other structure, mm -hmm. but, Again, if you look histologically, there are arachnoid cells in there, those structures. Also, from embryology, they are from the same layer. Yeah, meningiomas have been described to arise nearly everywhere in, in, in the body, probably because of um, uh, the precursor cells were sort of landed there during sort of the operational de development. But in terms of... Um, the CNS, you know, as you said, intraventricular location is probably the most common, you know, outside the typical subarachnoid space location, and and also they can occur in bone relatively yes. frequently, just purely intraosseous. Yeah. Okay. Then we. I just uh, heard that Professor Benesh is in the airport and wanted to connect online, but he he's failing doing that. So he cannot deliver his lecture, unfortunately. So I um, we move on and I ask Nasser, please um, um, start the second session. Although now I see again, um, hands raised on. Um, what shall what shall we do? You are you are muted, Nasser. So uh, we, I, I can't hear what you. I think two two are raising hands. Ahmed Fawad, yeah. president yeah. of Afghanistan Society. Can you speak, please? Yes, then he can speak. <laughs> yes. Uh, Salam alaikum. Greeting. 
Uh, I'm Dr. Ahmad Fawad Pizad from Afghanistan. Uh, excuse me, that's the chat box also. Now the question and answer box are uh, uh, not working and uh, this is disabled. For this, I write a question uh, box. Uh, sorry for that. And so we would like to also participate for uh, education uh, webinars in the future and uh, share our experience. This is first. And the second, uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. In the case of uh, we da damage the uh, facial nerves or uh, the sex nerves, uh, we uh, repair on the site during the operation or uh, in the, uh, in the, we do it uh, uh, later in the uh, future. Thank you. And there was another, but I, I don't see it anymore, but um, Dr. Nazir Ahmad had raised hands and he is unmuted. So Dr. Nazir, are you there? Then you can ask your question. And the former speaker, could you please mute yourself because we hear noises coming from your side. So please, if you can, if you speak, you can be unmuted, but otherwise please mute yourself because it is extremely disturbing to have all, um, background noises. Excuse me, I've got my message. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you, sir. Yes. No, Nasser, I uh, I really think that um, there is still this one plus Nord two with raised hand and a Dr. Nasir Ahmad, but they are not responding. So I think we should move on. Okay. And maybe the organizers can move them um, away from the panel because yes. especially when somebody is uh, still unmuted, then it can disturb. The they already removed now, Andreas. Perfect. Uh, so it's time for the second se uh, session. And thanks to the speakers and the discussants for the first session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Andy Grittenhouse, for moderating uh, the first session. Now we move to the second session. The moderator is Professor Alberto Delitella. Alberto, are you here? Alberto Delitala, can you hear us? Will you unmute yourself, please? Okay, until Alberto joins, he's already joining, but he, uh, he couldn't speak, I don't know why. We have our first speaker, uh, Professor Mario Amirati, speaking about meningiomas, the problem of recurrence. Mario, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Very good. Yes. Good. So let me start sharing the screen. Okay. So uh, the previous speeches, they were really great. And they showed us a lot of good uh, surgical approaches, a lot of very nice anatomy. And uh, I liked also very much the description of that uh, intraoperative real-time monitoring of the cranial nerves. And I would like to hear a little bit more later uh, about that, because I think that's really could, can be very, very helpful. So uh, I'm going to talk now about, uh, about the problem that uh, 
that really faces us after surgery. After surgery, uh, I mean, what do we do? Or what is the current, what are the current thoughts regarding recurrence in completely resected meningioma? So we all know that uh, the, uh, the backbone of uh, sort of a biological insight into the, into the behavior of meningioma is given by the histology, by the pathology. And we are all familiar with, uh, uh, with grade one, grade two, and grade three. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of subjectivity when, uh, when we're talking about uh, all the different features that come into play in order to assign a tumor to a certain grade or to another grade. Clearly, there are uh, black and white cases where that is really, uh, it's really, it's really very clear, but the majority of times are, are more of a, of, a, of a, we are more in a gray zone. And when you show the same pathology uh, to different competent neuropathologists, it is not uncommon uh, that people come with different uh, attribution of meningioma to different grades. Uh, the most important thing is that of, uh, you know, distinguish between a benign meningioma and the meningioma that is non-benign, that can be atypical or can be anaplastic. Uh, in, together with, uh, with this uh, pathological classification of meningioma, it's also important, you know, to go back to, to what is the Simpson grading of uh, tumor removal. Why? Because the Simpson grading, although it's very old and although it's imperfect, but still is the best is the best thing that we have in terms of assessing what has been the extent of removal of meningioma at surgery. Clearly, it's uh, to a certain extent is subjective, but for purpose of communication and for purpose of identifying, you know, variable. Uh, that may contribute to the biological behavior of a tumor, it uh, is still is the best tool that we have. So how do we handle grade one meningioma uh, that have been completely resected? And I have to say that uh, when, I, when I was finishing my residency, I was quite surprised because I thought the impression that I had during my residence is that, okay, you have a convexity meningioma, let's say two centimeter convexity meningioma, that's no big deal, that's a middle level resident case, you go in, take the tumor out and uh, you are done. And then I came across to some paper, uh, I think was from Finland, from uh, Jaska Linen, that uh, they had a very long-term follow-up of meningioma also because of the health system that uh, is present in, uh, in that country. So he came up with a figure with a 20 year follow-up of close to eight, 9% recurrence, even in convexity meningioma that had been completely removed with the grade one Simpson removal. So, so certainly meningioma are much more complex uh, that we are led to believe. And also the question before of the parasagittal and the falcotentorial meningioma that we know from clinical observation, I'm sure that at some point in time, we will be able to underpin this different clinical behavior and we will be able to uh, underpin them with, uh, with, uh, with molecular fingerprinting. But right now, I think that is very important uh, it's very important to, to try to use all the tools that we have in order to try uh, to ascertain what is the potential for recurrence um, of meningioma. And uh, there was a very nice paper published in neurosurgery last year in which there was a recursive partitioning analysis. Uh, recursive partitioning analysis in a nutshell try to identify several factors and see which of this factor, which combination of, of factor 
it's a node, meaning which combination of factories associated with a significant different variable that other, that other factors. So uh, in this paper, they considered you know, several factors. Some of them are very well known, like tumor size, tumor location, brain invasion, uh, and uh, the extent of surgery. And that's why I said Simpson grading is still very relevant, the mitotic index and things like that. And uh, they originally, they looked at 10 nodes and then they realized that really there were uh, several nodes, several nodes, several nodes that could be combined together in order to identify what uh, uh, the different degree of risk associated with a combination of variables finding meningioma, and they uh, and they came up with four different groups: uh, very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And you can see the progression-free survival. I mean, is stunning. I mean, the difference that you have from between very low risk, low risk and uh, uh, high risk is, is, uh, is stunning. And uh, uh, they take into consideration, as I said, all uh, the, the factors that uh, I have described before. Now, let me move this thing away because I don't like it. Um, so essentially, and I think I am blocked here now, is that? Okay, essentially, when you look at uh, all these all these different risk group, and you look at patient who had radiotherapy and did not have radiotherapy, you can see significant difference. For example, here you have the very low risk group with radiotherapy, that is the red line, and without radiotherapy. And uh, here, when you go to the to the high risk group, you can see that radiotherapy really uh, really helped significantly in, in increasing the progression-free survival. And the same thing is true for the very high risk group. So essentially, by combining a series of variables that are easily, that we can easily accrue, it's, it's possible to identify a different group with different pro prognosis, with different propensity to recurrence, and hence we can allocate radiation therapy to some group and not to some other group. That was a very interesting study, uh, clearly uh, needs to be uh, validated and needs to be replicated in order to be, uh, to be, to be really uh, used. On a complete different, on a complete different uh, tech, you have the Toronto group that pub that looked at different, uh, different uh, molecular uh, fingerprinting of meningioma and combined them with location and also with grading, and they came up with different, uh, with uh, with different uh, types of uh, uh, different group of meningioma growing from MG1 to MG4. Uh, MG4 is the one that has, a, has the worst progression-free survival, and MG1 is the one that has the best one. Clearly, uh, in order to, to use some of these variables, I mean, this is a very sophisticated process and uh, probably cannot be available to everybody, but I just want to show that to, to demonstrate, you know, the two different uh, the, two, the, two different, uh, the two different approaches. One approach that was more uh, clinical, if, uh, if we can say that, and the other one uh, that is more, relies more on molecular fingerprinting. I am not able to move my presentation, I don't know why. Here you go. Uh, of course, you know, you can look at all different genes in meningioma as well as in all other tumor, and you can find different things like uh, the P53 genes that, uh, as we know, the P53 pathways is implicated in many types uh, of cancer. And uh, that's, the, that's a, another paper that, uh, that looks at that. Uh, let me see here if I can move. Okay. Uh, 
so from a practical point of view, uh, how, I mean, where are we in terms of recommending radiation therapy or not radiation therapy? Uh, we had uh, this, uh, this, uh, this RTOG0539 that was a North American study in which, uh, in which meningioma were, uh, were, uh, were, group, were grouped into different, uh, into different risk groups. There was this intermediate risk group that, uh, that was formed by a patient either with grade two meningioma with gross total resection or also recurrent WHO grade one of any resection extent, as long as they recurred. They were the patients that, that formed this intermediate group. And uh, they looked at the uh, effect of radiotherapy, uh, essentially was intensity modulated uh, radiotherapy with 54 grain, 30 fraction. And although this one was a phase two non-randomized prospective study, uh, they came up with uh, the with uh, the the concept that their results support the use of postoperative RT for any grade two, irrespective uh, of uh, of the extent of resection, or also for recurrent grade one meningioma, also irrespective of resection. When they, when they look at the high-risk patient, the high-risk patient are those patients with a new or recurrent uh, grade three meningioma of any associated with any resection, recurrent grade two or new grade two after subtotal resection, they also uh, believe that the result of their uh, prospective non-randomized phase two study shows that uh, radiation therapy uh, is helpful in, uh, in this patient that they define high risk. Similar results were obtained by, in Europe by the EORTC uh, study. It was published in 2018. And they again was a, was a prospective, uh, not randomized study. And they, they put as, a, as, an end, uh, as an end result, a, a progression free survival of, uh, of 70%. And they demonstrated that their data showed that three years progression of free, free survival for a grade two meningioma uh, undergoing complete resection is superior to 70% when you use uh, post-operative high, radi high dose radiation therapy, 60 gray. So essentially, uh, what is the take home message from all these uh, study? I believe histological classification, although is a histological classification, but still remains the backbone of classification of meningioma. I am very much intrigued by recursive partitioning analysis is uh, potentially a very robust, but needs validation. And uh, parenthetically, uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar, but uh, the same group in Canada, they did uh, years ago, a similar study using recursive partitioning analysis in patients with malignant glioma. And uh, they came up with very solid data showing that really few analyze in a, in a very sophisticated way, a significant amount of data. And certainly today with the diffusion of AI that's done much easier, you can come to, to really uh, very powerful, very robust um, conclusions. So that's why I, I, am, I am a fan of this recursive partitioning analysis. Clearly, molecular fingerprinting is at the base of the different biological behavior of meningioma and probably represent the future of meningioma classification, but at the present time, it's still in evolution. Uh, we still need to, to define, uh, you know, what are the, the molecular fingerprinting that are really, really relevant in terms of uh, potential for recurrence. Uh, you know, we can get completely lost by looking at 1,000 uh, you know, uh, messenger RNA or 1,000 
uh, genes or everything else. So, but still, I believe it's uh, it's really the future of the meningioma classification. Uh, radiation therapy. I think that there is a general consensus that in grade three meningioma, and again we go back uh, to the importance of the histological classification. There is general consensus that in grade three meningioma, irrespective of resection, you need to give radiation therapy because those are, for all intent and purpose, you know, malignant mesenchymal tumor. Uh, there is not a general consensus on radiation therapy for grade two, especially if totally resected. In general, the radiation oncology uh, community uh, feels very strongly that in uh, uh, grade two meningioma, uh, you should consider RT, especially if, uh, if, the pay, if uh, there has not been a complete resection, but even if there has been a complete resection. Um, I, as many other people, we believe that uh, it's also important to put patient compliance in, uh, in, this, uh, in this decision-making process regarding radiation therapy, because if you have a completely resected grade two meningioma, and uh, you, you need to follow up the patient with frequent MRI in order to pick up the growth of the tumor. And we all know meningioma, they don't go from zero to 100 in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in two months. So if somebody with a grade two meningioma, especially if this meningioma has been uh, almost completely, but not totally resected, is willing and capable of undergoing MRI, maybe a three, four months for a certain number of years, and then uh, spacing them out more, then certainly could be a reasonable option. Uh, so in summary, molecular fingerprinting and recursive partitioning analysis data may be useful to decide which patient with total resection of grade two may be a candidate for radiation or for intensive neuroradiological follow-up and which patient with grade one will need aggressive neuroradiological follow-up because what comes up from uh, the, the, the limited molecular form fingerprinting data that we have and from the recursive partitioning analysis is that also, and what comes up from, from what we have known for years, grade one may also recur. Obviously is a, a small proportion in comparison to grade two, but if we are able, if we would be able to identify and to tag this patient with an intermediate low or high risk of recurrence, then we could, uh, even in a grade one that has been completely resected, we could, uh, we could counsel an aggressive neuroradiological uh, follow-up. And for grade three, we already have clinical consensus to recommend radiation therapy, even after complete resection. So uh, I, I think the, that's, uh, that's the, the message that I want to, to leave, especially the young colleague with, that uh, grade three meningioma, no matter what, uh, what the MRI postoperative show, they need to be radiated. Grade two, it's a gray area. I personally, if there is total resection and if the patient is compliant, I personally would not recommend radiation therapy also because often in times, the bed of a grade too many of a meningioma is a very large bed, and uh, in giving radiation therapy like 30 gray or sometimes 60 gray, uh, you know, it's something that is not uh, without uh, its own risks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mario, for this great talk. Uh, now we move to our second speaker. Vincenzo Esposito from Italy. He is going to speak about uh, extradural anterior clinoidectomy in treatment of paracellular meningioma. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. It's an honor for me to be here with you. And due to the educational purpose of this meeting, I will try to stay simple because. Uh, um, surgery for me must remain simple to be effective. And uh, 
I will, and now I will show. Could you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, so uh, the extradural anterior craniectomy is a very important procedure in neurosurgery. And uh, um, as you know, there are differences between the intradural technique that is mainly for vascular problems and the extradural technique. Uh, those indications are mainly for tumors, especially for meningioma. And uh, this procedure has uh, several advantages, uh, like as removal of hyperostatic part of tumors, devascularization of tumors, early identification ICA and optic nerve, and also the unlock the clindotectomy uh, uh, unlocked ICA aortic nerve and increase their maneuverability. And um, but all the young people fear about. Uh, complication, possible complication, be, uh, because uh, we can have uh, internal carotid artery injury, oculomotor nerve palsy, mainly for head con drill, an optic nerve injury, uh, cerebral spinal fluid leak, and also rarely a trochal nerve injury. So we need uh, to address of uh, this possible complication of extradural anterior craniodectomy. And I think, first of all, it must be um, the clinoid has uh, three, three roots. So um, uh, the clinoid is, is attached to the rest of the cranial base by a uh, lateral root, that is the sphenoid ridge, a uh, medial and superior root, that is the optic uh, um, roof of the optic canal, and the and medial and inferior roots, that is the optic strut. If you wish to remove the clinoid, you have to manage all these three roots. And uh, another very important topic is that whenever you uh, have a basic cranial tumor, you need also a CT scan because it's very important to see how the bone is, and especially if there is uh, some pneumatic gestion in the clinoid. This may be very dangerous because it's a source of CSF leak. And these are eight different patients with no tumors. And you can see here uh, how different may the clinoid uh, be. So you must be aware of this and you must have also a CT scan before surgery. It's very important. And uh, whenever you um, you um, have to remove an anterior cranial uh, um, process, I think is uh, you need a method. And for me, the, the best method is to uh, follow a lateral to medial direction. That is, remove the, um, the lateral part, the, the lateral roots of the crinoid thereafter you remove the, you make an eggshell technique and final step is to remove the uh, optic, uh, the roof of the optic canal and the optic strap. And you also, it's useful to have some aids to remember the surgical steps. Uh, you can use this uh, acronym, SMILES, that is, uh, and, and this acronym uh, resumes the steps in, uh, in uh, anterior craniectomy. Um, the first three steps are essentially dural steps. That is the identification of the superior orbital fissure, uh, the meningorbital band cut, and the interdural dissection. The last three are bone steps. That that is the lateral root removal, the eggshell removal of the clinoid, and finally the stratal roof of the optic canal. So if you use this simple acronym, you can easily remember these steps. And, um, and you see in these uh, uh, short videos, the uh, identification of the superior orbital tissue, the uh, uh, 
um, identification of the meaning of orbital band then must be cut. If you don't cut the meaning of orbital band, you cannot see the tip of the plane orbit. So it's very important to cut the meaning of orbital band. The um, third step is the interdural dissection. This is very easily done uh, in uh, patients. Um, and uh, you can uh, make a dissection between the dural, um, the temporal dura and the uh, dura, um, endocranial dura, uh, uh, in which you can see in transparencies the nerves of the uh, cavernous sinus. And uh, Thereafter, uh, you can start with the uh, um, bone uh, steps, the lateral root removal, the actual technique with uh, removal of the um, internal part of the clinoid. And thereafter, the last steps is the stratum roof removal with uh, completing the removal of the in this way, you can easily have a guide during removal, especially if you are not so experienced in this uh, technique. Uh, these are examples of tumors that can be removed using uh, also extradural craniectomy. Remember that whenever you have a basic cranial tumor, in basic cranial surgery, uh, I think the most important part of the basic cranial surgery is the extra dural part. And in this uh, uh, tumor, you see a huge clenolar tumor added to the uh, lateral part of the cavernous sinus. And you see uh, the extra dural part, V2 identification, superior orbital tissue, and uh, and the temporal dura, superior orbital fissure, the meaning orbital band, the clinoid, frontal dura. And thereafter, you can see the double layer of dura that must be dissected to expose completely the lateral part, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And the meaning orbital band uh, is uh, uh, identified, cut, till, cut and uh, Thereafter, you can expose completely clinoid, the roof of the optic canal. And uh, you see after removal of the canoid, you see the optic nerve, the ICA. Um, and thereafter, you, open, at this point, you open the dura. And in this point, the meningioma is no more bleeding because you have completely differentiated the meningioma during the extradural part of the surgery. And you see here the lateral wall of the cardinal sinus peeled by the dura and uh, the, the dressing of the meningioma, pusa, removal. And thereafter, you see the relevant anatomy ICA, P, uh, P, uh, PCOA meningioma is dissected, the, te the tentorium and the tercranial nerve. You see here the tercranial nerve, free edge of tentorium, liliquous membrane. And you see all the relevant anatomy. And, and at the end of the removal, you can see all this beautiful anatomy. And it's, if you can see all uh, the majority of this anatomy is covered by uh, pia and arachnoid. So it's also safe to remove this tumor in this, uh, in this way. And, uh, and also you see the um, Post-operative CT scan, um, you see the removal of the clinoid, the, uh, uh, the uh, sphenoid wing, you see here, here pre and post-operative removal of the uh, clinoid. And you see here how you can be uh, radical in, in this way, in this type of tumors. And uh, also you remove, um, all the attachment of the tumor, and also you, ca you can have a very good uh, post-operative outcome. And uh, um, similar techniques are used in, in this, uh, in this uh, type of tumors. And uh, you see a huge tumor uh, of this region, and the, uh, the technique is the same, extra dural part, and thereafter open the dura matter. 
and uh, uh, another huge tumor, you see often there is also a, a significant amount of edema around. So, and this also is a calcified tumor, you see here. And this is the result of this kind of removal. And also, you see also vision may improve significantly after surgery. Um, if you maintain these steps, another tumor of this kind, a huge tumor, 68 years old, uh, a patient with the hemiparesis, because often this patient had a significant amount of edema. So this patient needs surgery. And this uh, is the patient after surgery, um, another 75 years old patient with sudden memory loss, a huge tumor. You see also regularly we perform at least an angio MRI, uh, but uh, also we can do also an angio uh, CT, spiral angio CT, and to see the vessels. And you see also in aged patients, we can have a, a very good uh, result. Uh, and this is uh, another uh, similar tumor. The technique is exactly the same. The same way you see here uh, um, the removal of the clinoid, also the, uh, the sphenoid ridge. And another aged patient, 34 year patient, huge edema, hemiparesis. And so this patient needs surgery. Um, and you see here, uh, again, good results with regression of edema and also the patient with normal life after surgery. And uh, other kind of tumors, also similar tumor, very similar tumors. The technique is always the same. Uh, I, I respect you. And also the removal of the orbiter uh, of the clinoid and the sphenoid ridge, the same, same technique. So this is my um, experience in the last 10 years, 50 patients. Visual symptoms are uh, predominating in this uh, patient. Um, this is the Almefti classification. I prefer to classify this patient according to the extension in uh, several quadrants. If you uh, draw a line, draw a cross centering above the clinoid, uh, processed in the coronal uh, plane, you can uh, divide uh, the extension as supralateral, supramedial, inframedial, infralateral. And the most difficult cases are those that are that have an inframedial, uh, an inframedial extension, obvious, obviously due to the uh, 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 relationship with the uh, carotid artery, also with vessel. The, um, Patients that have the most, uh, um, the higher um, percentage of uh, removal in good uh, outcome are the superlateral and infralateral patient. And uh, um, you see complication. Uh, what is relevant? Uh, we have no ICA injury. This is the most feared complication. There is no, um, no, uh, no, a single case, not a single case of the ICA of ICA injury. There are. Uh, patient with third kernel parsidu, probably from the head hop from the deal. Also, patient that have a second uh, kernel injury, and on, only two patients with a CFS leak. You see, also vision um, ma may improve in a consistent number of cases. Uh, as you see uh, here, the visual outcome uh, is improved in uh, two thirds of cases. And um, so, in conclusion, the extradural anterior craniodectomy is a very important technique, and it increases exposure of neurovascular structure, structure uh, allows an optical nerve decompression, removal of particular bone and tumor devascularization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Esposito, for this great presentation. Uh, now it's time to move to our uh, third speaker in this session, Professor Thomas Santerius from Cambridge University, UK. is going to speak about preservation of smell in olfactory growth management. Thank you, Professor Esposito. Uh, uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, can you see um, the screen? Can I see yes, my screen? Yes, perfect, Thomas. Okay, and so clearly you can hear me. So th thank Sorry. you again very much, uh, uh, Nasser, for um, inviting me to give um, uh, our presentation. I'll share um, some of our experience, our institutional exper experience with preservation of, of uh, smell in olfactory groove meningioma. Um, here is uh, to acknowledge um, people who have been um, working on this project. And uh, mm -hmm. also, I just want to say um, that it, it is not something we've invented. It's been done around the world uh, for uh, some time. Um, so what are olfactory groove meningiomas? These are meningiomas arising from olfactory groove and anatomically uh, we define this area as starting from Crista Galli, which is, which is here, and um, until the planum sphenoidale. And the planum sphenoidale finishes at the limbus and um, tubercular meningiomas start from here, but our focus are olfactory groove meningiomas today. And I'd like to start with a, a study that uh, we did um, in response to um, a nice publication um, by the <coughs> Pittsburgh group when they looked at 50 um, cases of endoscopic endonasal surgery for olfactory groove meningiomas. And what uh, caught our eye uh, was, um, first of all, conclusion that um, one can achieve good outcomes, but also that there are certain characteristics um, which, uh, if, if the tumor um, has them, um, uh, there is a greater probability of um, post-operative complications, and these include tumor size, calcification, absence of cortical vascular cuff, and um, anterior involvement of the uh, um, frontal sinus. So uh, we ask uh, ourselves, do these factors that influence um, risks in um, endonasal surgery uh, influence the uh, the outcomes in uh, in transcranial resection. And uh, secondly, what proportion of cases now in practice would be suitable for endoscopic endonasal resection if we try to eliminate these risk factors? So um, uh, we conducted a retrospective study. Um, uh, cases were accrued by three senior surgeons, and we also selected 50 cases, consecutive cases, as um, in the quoted paper. They were pure olfactory group meningioma and uh, done in this sort of time period. And as in the paper, we looked at radiological characteristics um, as, as described in the uh, previous paper. It's been published, so we can read it um, if you want later in greater detail. For that particular series, this were the approaches. Um, as you can see, quite a lot of bifrontal approaches at that time, which um, have since um, sort of slightly fizzled out. Um, I personally don't do bifrontal approaches. Um, but again, they have been previously described, and you can see how they were exactly done. And and, um, and I suppose in some cases, they can still be um uh, so applicable. So we had uh, 50 cases. Um, our mean age was slightly higher. Uh, also, our uh, tumor diameter was greater, um, and uh, we had a um, greater proportion of Simpson grade one resections. And um, our favorable outcome, i.e., a modified Rankin scale zero to two um, was achieved in 86% uh, of cases. So what number of tumors considered suitable for endonasal um, endoscopic uh, resection uh, were, uh, were found in our series? Um, and, and the answer is only three cases. So three out of 50 
uh, makes it um, six percent. Not many. So do factors that affect results of endoscopic resection of olfactory groove meningiomas affect outcome, i.e. complications uh, of uh, transcranial resection? And based on the cohort that we had, again, we have to keep in, keep in mind that this were only 50 cases. So none of these factors uh, was um, significantly associated with uh, with bad outcome, i.e., with with complications. Of course, you know, if we had 500 instead of um, 50 cases, we would have even more meaningful result. But um, in, you know, it is not easy to accrue such a large series. But certainly, there doesn't seem to be any any tight um, association for sure. Um, so, do factors that affect degree of resection result? Uh, of endoscopic resection of olfactory groove meningioma affect transcranial degree of resection. Again, sim similar method, uh, looking at um, Simpson grade one versus non Simpson grade one. And again, no factors were uh, anywhere near significantly associated with um, a degree of uh, resection. So we concluded that although endoscopic endonasal surgery for olfactory groove meningioma has become an important part of the armory of skull-based surgeons in practice. Only a small proportion, um, especially large meningiomas, uh, well, as, as, especially small meningiomas may be suitable for surgeons with modest experience of endoscopic endonasal resection, given that safe, effective surgery um, can be done transcranially. Most factors affecting resection rates and complications for endoscopic endonasal surgery do not negatively influence outcome following transcranial surgery. And uh, preservation of olfaction is more likely in smaller central tumors. These tumors are those suitable for endoscopic endonasal surgery. So this was really what uh, prompted us to have a look at um, um, olfactory uh, presentation. Um, Again, going back to the um, uh, paper by the, by the Pittsburgh group, um, uh, there's a direct quotation from that paper. Olfactory, ol olfaction is not addressed directly in our outcomes because loss is expected. So, um, you know, what happens um, in our series with olfactory presentation? So we looked at um, 76 cases. Um, 90, again, just to describe the cohort, 90% of them uh, were large with um, ma a maximum diameter greater than four centimeters and and quarter of them had extension to the planum uh, sphenoidale, i.e. posteriorly. Um, the approaches used were um, bifrontal transbasal, interhemispheric and uh, unilateral frontotemporal um, gradually uh, more and more popular, and and it is really an approach that I have personally been been using. We tried some um, in in the initial stages endoscopic surgery. Of course, it's it's uh, perfectly feasible, but um, it uh, fell out of favor with our group for for you know number of reasons, which are hopefully obvious from this uh, presentation presentation. So. Let's have a look at olfaction. Um, it was present preoperatively in 42% um, of cases. And of these, um, we managed to preserve smell in about half of the cases. And um, preoperative anosmia was associated, <laughs> excuse me, associated with edema, calcifications, and um, seizures. I suppose seizures and edema may be um, may be um, also associated. Um, Post-optive loss of smell, i.e. occurrence of new anosmia in cases where um, uh, where there was some sense of smell pre-optively was associated with extension beyond mid-pupillary line, so, so big tumors. Um, approach, um, the the least likely loss of smell happen in the frontal temporal um, approach. Um, 
so of course there are other considerations perhaps even more important consideration than a sense of smell however um sense of smell is important often associated with sense of taste and overall enjoyment of food and life and some important factor in quality quality of life so i think if we can uh, uh preserve it of course there's no point in trying to preserve it um if there is no sense of smell because it is very rare that um smell will uh, return if it was not present preoperatively it did not happen in our series and in most published series although i know that some authors are um, advocating it so you know how we go about it first of all we determine whether there's a sense of smell and this can um, be done um just simply by um you know taking sort of history about smell and food and so on but um, we then use um, APSID, the University of Pennsylvania Smell Identification Test Administration, and um, uh, simply occlude one nostril and uh, uh, determine how much um, smell is there in the other nostril, uh, simply by patients um, trying to guess what the, the um, smell reminds them of. They do the same thing with the other nostril um, generally they quite enjoy this game and in the end um, we get a very reliable test which nostril is is working uh, which one is not uh, working and um, we then try to marry it with um, with um, radiological findings for example here you can see that um, it is more likely that the sense of smell is preserved on the on the right side and when um, we find that smell of uh, sense of smell is preserved on the right side. I would approach this tumor uh, from left subfrontal approach. Um, we then can get to the um, um, to the functioning uh, olfactory tract um, sort of gently uh, under control and and essentially dissect and roll away. Uh, the tumor and leave the nerve intact. So that's uh, what I have to say, and I'm I'm happy uh, to discuss that further. I'm sure our distinguished faculty will have uh, um, uh, um, a lot of useful comments to make. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, if nobody's saying anything, can I say something, Tom? Absolutely, please do. <laughs> Two bits of honesty, which I like. The first one is honesty, read the uh, ISL approach, which I think some of us are beginning to feel has been slightly um, over uh, taken up and, and you know, virtually everything is being done that way. As you rightly point out, if you can get good results with a craniotomy, there's very little against that. And of course, there's all the problem about CSF leak. But I think it's very important for those of us who have a, a taste for whiskey and wine to appreciate how important the sense of smell and taste is. So thank you for that. Yes, th th thank you for making the point. It, it certainly is um, sort of underappreciated um, factor in quality of life. And of course, um, in the early stages of neurosurgery, we we're all happy that the patient survived the operation. Um, then are sort of standards um, going up. And I think if we if we have a patient with sense of smell and we can preserve it, I think we should just try. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have some questions of our panel, somebody raising hands too. If anybody like to... Uh... Speak directly, Galal, Jalal, Najjar, you are allowed to speak. If you like to contribute to discussion, please speak. Go yeah. ahead. Thank you. I have a question for our uh, just for our speaker, and uh, I was raising my hand for the previous speaker. If he, uh, if you allow me, if he is still here. Of course, here. yes, please. Yes. Uh, my first question for uh, this lecture: uh, Do you think that the period of losing the function of uh, smelling uh, playing role to for recovery? Uh, for this, whenever the tumor is big or large, and the 
by factory meningioma? Um, I'm not sure I completely understood the question. Do, do you mind um, rephrasing again? So, period, so, so if a uh, loss of period, a uh, loss of smell for a period when? Pre pre operation pre operation. Yeah. So, matter, yes. That's just, that's oh, you mean period. whether there was yes. a, some sort of periodic loss of loss of smell? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. I, I we haven't sort of specifically looked at it. Um, the fact that there was some periodic loss of smell um, could probably be attributed to either intermittent compression, swelling, maybe some abnormal electrical activity. Who knows? But it sounds like um, if there was truly complete uh, loss, it, it's going to be probably quite a quite a risky one because there's already something not hundred percent, at least in one. Uh, well, certainly one and probably two olfactory tracts. So um, I hope it's somewhat helpful answer, but I'm sure some other uh, panel members would uh, would um, add to it. Oh, thank you. Uh, is yes, one... Nasser, uh, this is Mario. Can I, can I say something? <clears throat> yes, please. I can see uh, Mario like to speak and the house and the yeah. Shambas unit. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, two things. First thing, I am so pleased to hear from uh, Tom and Alistair the some putting putting mildly mildly the concern about uh, the overuse of the endoscopic approach. As you probably know, I have been uh, I have been sort of saying that for quite some times, even for very simple, not extended endonasal approach. I think the elephant in the room is the, 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 nasal, the nasal complication whenever you do an endonasal approach on which we rarely talk. But I have done a number of endoscopic procedure years ago. And uh, I followed up with the patient together with my ENT colleagues. And I can tell you, I don't remember having heard anybody screaming as much as the endoscopic patient when they were removing crusts from mm -hmm. their nose. So that's something that uh, unfortunately, we as neurosurgeons <clears throat> have been completely oblivious to. And that is our fault on one hand, because we are always very ready to jump on whatever new is there for, for obvious reasons. At least in the United States, the reasons are obvious. Are we, we get paid based on what we do, no matter if you are in academia or if you're not in academia. And, um, and, that's, the, and uh, that's the reason why a lot of these procedures have, have been done, uh, really have been used for everything. But anyway, so I, I, I certainly appreciate that and I certainly second those concerns. The, the, the other thing that I, the question for Tom, Thomas is, uh, you talk about the subfrontal approach and the interhemispheric approach. The, you, I think the subfrontal was the one that was used most of the time. Now, the subfrontal, you know, you, you need to move the frontal lobe or you need to have the frontal lobe to move away from the skull base. So just in order to, to be understood by everybody, if you use retractors, and, and I personally don't think that retractor is a swear word, then you must retract up. When you do the basal anterior interhemispheric approach, then you dissect the interhemispheric fissure basally, and then you put the retractor and you retract sideways. So I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's an important uh, concept that needs to be understood, especially by the by uh, you know the young people who are following uh, you know this webinar. So anyway, I I agree hundred percent on the importance of preserving uh, uh, the olfactory function. And uh, when I do an olfactory groove meningioma, the first thing that I do, I mean, other than do, doing obviously a very a very basal craniotomy, and I really don't care about entering the frontal sinus because. It's not, uh, you know, we, we can deal with that very easily. But I, I dissect the olfactory nerve from the undersurface of the, 
uh, of the frontal lobe. And uh, sometimes, you know, you have enough space and uh, there is a real cistern there. So you, you can do that very easily, relatively easily. Other times it's just impossible because they are just like part of the brain. So it's impossible to, uh, to separate them. So, but I congratulate the professor Santarius and, uh, mm -hmm. and his very nice, very educational presentation. Thank you very much for, for your points. I can see uh, that there are um, hands raised, um, Andre and uh, Hisham. Yeah, well, uh, Tom, I uh, certainly also appreciate that you point it out again, because many patients after such a surgery uh, will not tell you, and nobody is testing it until you see them the first time. And then they say, by the way, I, I can't smell anything anymore. Actually, one of my trigger cases was a pica aneurysm that I did from here. And from the loss of CSF, that lady lost also her smell, had an anosmia, sucking away too much CSF. What we did, and that's a little trick that I want to share with the, uh, also with the participants. What I do in those cases, and also what Mario says about dissecting the olfactory nerve, um, and we published that a long time, 25, well, 1998. It's a coating of cranial nerves with a thin layer of translucent fibrin glue. The moment you have exposed it, and the problem is not the olfactory, the bulb itself, it is at the, it's the filaments. So we glue the bulb into its place. We place the glue there. I do it also in the CP angle. I will exactly, use, yeah. That, I will that, that, use the glue in the, let's say, the corbel cranial nerves but when I do seven and eight and fifths. So that's that's a difference to help. And um, it, it, it will not prevent um, in, in all cases, but we could show that it will, um, they will not dry out because hours of an operating microscope over uh, the area. And um, it, it, it helps in preserving it. That's a great point. I, I wanted to add to it that um, although we call it olfactory nerve, it's, it's not really kind of a nerve. No. Um, and that the weak point is really the olfactory filler going through the cryptoform plate. Yeah, you have to the face. olfactory mucosa. So, and they're extremely vulnerable. We, we often hear a lot about not retracting uh -huh. cerebellum uh -huh. not to pull out the cochlear nerves. Uh, fibers as they enter the, the cochlea, but this is similar and, and perhaps even more sensitive um, area for surgery. So easy. you have a 30 degree wow. endoscope, even if you do another case, let's say sphenoid meningioma, you put the 30 degree endoscope and with, with this, you, you glue the bulb into the place. It's there, it's covered with, with, and then you go ahead with your tumor resection, but it prevents that inadvertently because of the retraction and loss of CSF, you will more or less after some hours have um, severed the little filaments already. I mean, and the idea is really yep. ideally not to even move the um, healthy. You should um, not. Yeah, so kind of as, as we all. always dissect meningioma, so, so the idea is to uh, pull the arachnoid towards the nerve rather and than... And not away from it. And yeah, it yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, and there's one thing that, that uh, Maria Amirati also said, I really forbid my residents to talk to patients about endonasal uh, procedures as being minimally invasive. That's even a word that we, that we don't use because to the nose, it is absolutely very maximally invasive. So has nothing to do, they don't see the scar um, in, in the outside, but it is for extended skull base, it's an awful thing what we do to the nasal structures. Hey, Sean, and it's still a cranial well. yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a very nice trick. Thank you, Andre. It's, uh... I, I will consider it in uh, the next uh, surgeries. Um, I, um, I'm asking if um, I'm, I'm um, uh, taking the, the important sentence what uh, Professor Esposito said, uh, make approaches simple. And uh, I saw that you had a lot of um, removal of the orbital bar. And I 
think you you do not need it. I know that it is uh, to protect the frontal lobe and uh, lessen the the uh, retraction, but I think it uh, that you uh, because it's it's a it's a further surgical step and every surgical step uh, has its own risk. Uh, so I think you uh, you must not uh, remove the orbital. But I've got another presentation which is very similar to to yours today. So um, so I, I'm I didn't I never um, removed or did an orbiter to me um, in these um, in the um, uh, olfactory groove uh, meningioma cases. And uh, that's one point. The yeah, other I, point I, I I agree completely. In fact, myself I haven't been doing this sort of. Uh, approaches for a very long time. I, I I essentially completely use so unilateral approaches for for quite some time now. Yeah, and also it's very important to preserve um, the uh, vascularization of the um, of the olfactory nerve. That's very important for preservation of the um, smell function. Um, and so you should not coagulate. And usually you find in, um, in, uh, if, if the nerve is not involved by the tumor, you find a, um, an arachnoid which is protecting it, which is the arachnoid of the, of the, um, of the olfactory um, tract. Um, and the, the, I think the, the usual cases of, of losing smell is one as the olfactory filaments. And also, if you are going back in large, especially in large tumors, then the, the um, olfactory nerve is a very delicate, especially with time, becomes more and more delicate. So it, it, it loses its continuity. Uh, so, so I think this uh, you have to uh, take very care. Uh, when you use retractors, I'm not using any more, but um, even if you are not using retractors, you have to retract a bit to come to the back of the tumor. If you're using a frontal approach or even a frontal lateral, frontal lateral approach, uh, and then you uh, stretch in the nerve uh, for yeah, your repeating stretching or your continuously stretching, and then it will lose its continuity. And this is, um, I think, this is a, one of the reasons uh, to lose the smell function. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, there's uh, Dr. Najar. Is, uh, going yes, to end up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Radur and all speakers, and uh, nice to see uh, Dr. Basioni after 20 years from the UMMS. My question to uh, our professor from uh, the previous uh, lecture about Esposito. Uh, I have two points. When you move from the extradural uh, anterior clinodectomy to intradural clinodectomy, the second uh, question, do you think the anterior clinodectomy is also um, uh, effective in protection of the uh, vision in uh, supracellular uh, tumors like uh, craniopharyngioma and adenoma, which is uh, different from meningioma and in, likes to be cystic or more soft tumors? And thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your questions. Uh, first of all, I, uh, you never uh, need to move to an intradural removal of the cranoid because uh, extradural cranoid is by definition a complete removal of a cranoid. You never need this. Uh, the indications are different. You need an extradural cranoid for tumors and uh, uh, otherwise, for vascular problem for aneurysm, you do an intradural cranioidectomy because you need to control uh, vessels during, during the removal. The intradural cranioidectomy is less extensive than extradural cranioidectomy. Whenever you do an extradural cranioidectomy, you re, you you be able to remove uh, the whole cranioidal. Pre, uh, uh, rather a complete removal of the clinical. So, so you do not need to move from the arm to the other. But the, the second question also is very interesting because uh, this was a, an original proposal by Dolenz to, because you, you, as you know, Dolenz was the original, um, uh, made the, the original work on the extradural kind of technique. And Dolenz also proposed to 
do extra do like an electron to um, to have more uh, maneuverability over uh, optic nerve uh, carotid uh, artery so to uh, enlarge the space to remove also craniopharyngiomas adenomics etc i never do this but Dolenz pro uh, proposed this so your question is very uh, very interesting thank you thank you um, just to be a little bit provocative here, um, essentially any um, uh, clinoidectomy can be extradural, even the one you start intradurally first. You, you just need to cut the dura once you're intradurally um, and uh, peel it off, and then you're essentially doing extradural clinoidectomy with all the relevant anatomy exposed. Um, that, that's another option, particularly in vascular surgery. And uh, with uh, craniopharyngiomas, of course, um, if if the endoscopic surgery is not available, then it's not available. But um, as as much as we've been slugging off um, endoscopic approaches, I think craniopharyngioma is one of the yeah, after or maybe together with um, uh, with pituitary adenomas, the ultimate indication for endoscopic approach. Should we move on to the next session? Thank you very much. I think it's time to remove uh, to to move to the third session, uh, and uh, I will give the mic to Professor Jenkins Alistair, the moderator of the third session. I just have message from uh, from uh, the first speaker, Jose Alberto. He uh, is uh, going to join uh, a bit later, and so I suggest to speak to to uh, to Jenkins to start by the second speaker. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Nasser, for organising all this wonderful series of lectures, and in particular for asking me to to come and, and uh, worship at the feet of the masters. Um, an apology for being slightly late, as I just said to Tom, the reason I was late was because I was doing a meningium, <laughs> which seemed to have some poetic justice to it. Um, so we're starting off then with uh, one of my favourite things, I have to say, petroclival meningiomas. And uh, one of two talks about a system uh, for this. So, Gerardo Guinto from Mexico, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good, good morning, good evening, good, 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 good night to everyone and all around the world. Uh, I want to I want to thank Professor El Gandura and Professor Luis Borba for inviting me to participate in this wonderful meeting. It's a great honor for me, and it's and uh, it's what I already said. The petroclaval meningiomas is a very controversial point that I want to share with you our our experience on these particular tumors. Where I'm going to talk about uh, a simple system that we have this, uh, developed for the that uh, may help for the selection of the approach. So this starts with the, with the subject. Petroclaval meningiomas are tumor that are originated right here in the joint, in the articulation between the petrous apex and the upper two thirds, two -thirds of the clivus. But uh, of course, this definition also have to, has to fit another condition, which is the trajectory of the trigeminal nerve. For considering a uh, uh, many geomas are petroclival, of course, the trigeminal nerve has to run lateral to the tumor. Because if, the, if this nerve is running medial to the tumor, this is not strictly a petroclival many geoma. So we have two different kinds of tumors in this, in this location, pretty similar in the location, in the, in the aspect, but are very different in the surgical approach. So in the left side, you have a real petroclaval meningioma because the trigeminal nerve is running lateral to the tumor. And in the other side, we have another kind of tumor because the trigeminal nerve is running medial to the tumor. So this kind of tumors can be, can be called as a petrous tumor or maybe pontocerebral meningioma or even tentorial meningioma, but actually they are not petro real petroclival. 
So uh, there are several surgical approaches that have been described for the resection of these tumors, but the most common are the following, anterior transpetrosal, posterior transpetrosal, and retrosigmoid approach. Of course, the retrosigmoid approach is the more suitable because it offers uh, an ample exposure, is very fast and very safe, and is almost one of the is one of the most popular approaches done all around the world. So our, our concept is that uh, our thesis is that most of these uh, petroclavar meningiomas can be removed by a by a simple retrosigmoid approach. But then let's make the analysis. Retrosigmoid approach is uh, is uh, the, the exposure of the area is gotten by the retraction of the cerebellum, the posterior retraction of the cerebellum. But let's see what happened with this posterior retraction of the cerebellum. This movement of the cerebellum behind is actually a rotation of the cerebellum having an axis with is the brainstem and with the uh, 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 a radius of movement, which is the middle cerebellar peduncle. So when we mobilize the cerebellum behind, we can expose the petroclaval region and also the PC angle. When the tumor are located here, sometimes it's very easy to expose for a simple retrosigmoid approach. But of course, the main part that obstructs the surgical view from this perspective is this portion, this anatomic uh, area, which is the middle cerebellar peduncle. So we have here two petroclavar tumors, two petroclavar, real petroclavar meningiomas. But you see the one on the left is located uh, closer to the midline than the one on the right. Let's see what happened with the retrosigmoid approach with each tumor. Let's start with, the, with, the, with this tumor. If we mobilize the cerebellum behind, the uh, surgical view is not going to be adequate because the tumor is not completely exposed because of the location of this of this lesion. If we see the other the other example in this particular case, if we mobilize the cerebellum behind in a in a retrosigmoid approach, it's possible to see that the exposure is is very 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 is enough to removal of this lesion. So. We, we have here two, two different kinds of tumors, but one of them can be used, the, the retrosigmoid approach can be used, and the other one, this approach cannot be used. So we have designed a system to analyze, to decide which, if the retrosigmoid approach can be applied. Of course, all of this uh, procedure, we can, uh, everybody does it in, in their mind, but we, we try to make this, uh, the decision making based on some objective facts. So, uh, as I said, the main of structure for uh, obstruct uh, a structure that obstructs the uh, the surgeon's view from a petroclavar meningioma is this: is the middle cerebellar peduncle. This peduncle is a pyramid shaped structure that has a apex directed to the brainstem and the base directed to the to the cerebellum. The apex is always always displaced because the tumor is located here. So the main point that has the, the surgeon's view is the base of the middle cerebellar peduncle. To know where the, this uh, base of the peduncle is located, we have uh, a, a design a system to, to analyze this, this structure. If we draw a line that joins the lateral portion of the fourth ventricle and the spiral surface of the cerebellum in the exact point between the junction of the middle, the smooth surface of the middle cerebral peduncle and the folia, we can find that this line corresponds to the base of the peduncle. So we have called this line as the peduncular line. So if we analyze objectively the degree of displacement of this peduncular line that is exerted by the tumor, theoretically, we, went, we can predict if the uh, posterior, I mean, the, the, the retrosigmoid approach can be applied in every case. So we have here these uh, two examples with uh, similar tumors, but again, this tumor on the left is more lo is located closer to the midline than the tumor on the right. Both of them are petroclival. But let's analyze our system in each of these tumors. Let's start with this on the on, on the on the right. Our system began begins with the, a, a line that which is draw, drawn in the posterior surface 
of the Petrus bone. We have called this bone as the Petrus line or Petrosa line. A second line is drawn perpendicular to this line, but crossing the midpoint of the tumor. This line we have called as tumor line, and we have divided this line into three, uh, three thirds. Then we draw the Petrosa line, the pedunculate line, sorry, as, we, as I said previously, but marking the middle point of this line. And then a final line, a final line is drawn perpendicular to the tumor line, but passing simultaneously to the center of the peduncular line. This is the line. And if this last line is drawn below the second mark on the tumor line, this tumor cannot be easily exposed by a retrosigmoid approach. Let's see the other case. Then I'm going to draw, to draw the Petrosa line. He is the tumor line divided into three thirds then the peduncular line with the centers uh, marked and the third line perpendicular to the tumor line, but passing simultaneously to the center of the peduncular line. As you can see here, this last line is drawn beyond the second mark. It means that theoretically, the retrosigmoid approach could be an excellent option for the correct or the, or, or the enough exposure of the tumor. Based on this data, we have uh, joint put together all the patients with uh, petroclaval tumors that uh, came to our department from uh, 2012 to 2016. We divided the petroclaval meningiomas into two groups. On group A, we put all the patients with favorable displacement of the, retro of the peduncular line, so they were eligible for retrosigmoid approach. On group B, we put all the patients that were not favorable for the or not eligible for, for, for a retrosigmoid approach. The only exclusion criterion was if during surgery, we realized that the trigeminal nerves was running medial to the tumor, uh, immediately we canceled this patient, we uh, 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 not include those patients for, the, for our study. So we include 20 patients. Remember that real pretroclives are not very frequent. So we included 20 patients with real pretroclival meningiomas more of, most of them were women with an average age of 50 year old with an average size of tumor of four centimeters. And uh, surprisingly, most of the patient belonged to the group A. So most of the patient could be uh, removed by the retrosigmoid approach. Let's see some examples. Here we have all those patients with, uh, in, in group A, as you see, all, in all cases, the displacement of the peduncular line was favorable, so th those patients were operated on through a retrosigmoid approach. You see here the group B, there were more uh, bigger tumors with no, not adequate displacement of the peduncular line, so in those cases, we used a posterior and anterior transpetrosal approach. We, don't, we could not uh, uh, select those patients for retrosigmoid approach. Let's, let's see some some a, a few cases just to show the, the some examples. Let's start with group E. You see, here is the tumor, and with the, maybe some invasion to the cavernous sinus, but you see the most part, part of the tumor is growing into the posterior fossa. And if we analyze, we have a displacement of the peduncular line. So this patient was selected for a retrosigmoid approach. And this is the surgery in the right retrosigmoid approach. And this is the uh, uh, the surgical view, as you see here at the beginning, the posterior displacement of the cerebellum exposes the tumor almost completely. This is the seven and eight cranial nerve, and the uh, surgery begins with the aspira uh, 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 ultrasonic aspirator above and below the seven and eight cranial nerve, and uh, dissecting the tumor medial to the nerves is the most in, most difficult part of the of the tumor because. Uh, it, it, you, uh, we don't have a direct view of this medial aspect of the nerves. So a piecemeal resection is, of course, mandatory. Then when the removal of the tumor is on the seven and eight cranial nerves, we are mobilized the, the, uh, the upper, upper part of the, of the surgical field. Here is the fifth cranial nerve, lateral displaced, and the fourth cranial nerve. And I'm looking for the sixth nerve in the clivus. Here is the removal of the more uh, the inferior part of the tumor just to find the sixth cranial nerve which is running here to the Dorelos canal here 
in the clivus and in the cavernous sinus. And this is the last piece of, of the tumor that is being resected. And uh, this is the seven and eight, the fifth nerve uh, displaced lateral, the sixth cranial nerve and the implant. And this is the control MRI. On the left, left side, you have the pre and the post-operative view. You see a correct, a, well, a, a satisfactory resection of the tumor. Maybe a slight a, a bright brightness is here in the clivus, but the patient is completely without any neurological deficit. Let's see another example. You see, this is another tumor. It's a bigger tumor. There is no invasion to the cavernous sinus, no invasion to the makel scape, and it was elected for the selected for the retrosigmoid approach. As you see, the displacement of the pedunculate line. In this case, a left retrosigmoid approach, as usual a regular and standard retrosigmoid approach. And this is the surgery. You see here the fifth cranial nerve displaced laterally, the tumor growing medial to this nerve. The surgery began with the internal aspiration of the tumor above and below the fifth cranial nerve. This is the seventh cranial nerve. This is the sixth cranial nerve that is in, the part in this particular case was double and the lower cranial nerves in the inferior part of the, of the area. This is the basilar artery. You can see how the basilar artery can be exposed by a simple retrosigmoid approach because of the tumor it gives a, a space for the exposure. And this is the resection of the last piece of tumor. And this is the surgical field when the tumor was completely taken out. And these are the lower cranial nerves, seven and eight, six cranial nerve here, seven cranial nerve, and the third and fourth cranial nerve and basilar artery. You see how, because the tumor was displacing the middle peden cerebellar peduncle, it exposed the, reg the, 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 the region very, very, uh, 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 very well. So we could remove the tumor with, through this uh, simple approach. This is the result on the left side. You, his, you can see here the pre and in, in the right side, the postoperative MRI, you can see the removal of the tumor was completely, microscopically completely, and that's the patient two days after the procedure, and she didn't present any, any, any clinical problem. Another example you see here, this is a tumor with invasion to the Makel's cave. This is a, a, a patient, this is a doctor, a, a, a lady that didn't want any a problem with the oculomotor nerves. That's why we didn't touch this part of the tumor, even though it's approachable through an anterior transpitrosal approach. So we focus only on the posterior component of the tumor just to avoid any risk of oculomotor deficit. And you see here, the uh, pedunculate line is adequately displaced. So a posterior a retrosigmoid approach was used in this other case. And in this case, a, re, a, a left retrosigmoid approach, and again, this is the initial, uh, the initial part of the tumor, seven and eight, fifth cranial nerve displaced laterally, both of, uh, of those nerves. And the surgery is almost the same. With, it begins with the, the compression, internal decompression of the tumor. Here is ICA. It's very important to find early uh, uh, identification of this artery and follow the artery up to the basilar artery. In the origin of the basilar artery, which is located here, just to be able to control this artery, here is the origin of ICA and the basilar artery here, clearly seen because the tumor displaced the uh, middle cerebellar peduncle. And I'm working on the implant in the, in the uh, petrus apex and in the tentorium. This is the fourth cranial nerve that is fine with the tumor uh, surrounding the tumor, the, the nerve. So we left a small pieces of tumors around the, surrounding the nerve just to avoid the oculomotor deficit and the coagulation of the final of the implant in the petrus apex, as you say, as you can see here, and the final view of the surgery. Again, this is the uh, fifth and se uh, seven and eight and fifth cranial nerves, lower cranial nerves, and the basilar artery with ICA clearly seen with a retrosigmoid approach. And the result uh, here is the pre and sagittal and axial view with. Uh, complete resection of the posterior component of the tumor with the tumor remaining in the Meckel's cave, but the patient didn't have any neurological, any uh, uh, oculomotor deficit and was submitted under the observation. Just if, the, if this residual tumor showed uh, shows some uh, growing, that, that patient has to be taken to radio surgery. Let's, a couple of examples on group B. You see, these tumors are bigger than in the older group, located in the middle line. And of course, here is very difficult to apply 
a retrosigmoid approach to control the whole tumor. So in those cases, we used a combination of anterior and posterior transpetrosal approach to remove these tumors. And it, this is the uh, explanation of the, of the, of the approach. It, it, it includes a, a mastoidectomy and a craniotomy in the posterior temporal area just to be able to expose the tumor by a subtemporal a, 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 a access to the petroclavian region and the posterior displacement of the sigmoid sinus and the cerebellum to be able to expose all this area. And this is the end of the surgery. You can see here how the tumor could be removed completely. That uh, is uh, analyzed here in the MRI. Here, I, here is the preoperative and the postoperative control MRI. You see how the tumor could be removed completely. And this is the patient which she had some uh, uh, weakness on the side of the approach because of more mobilization of the nerve. So the risks of, of uh, damage on the cranial nerves are higher than in the other group. Another example, see more complex tumors located in the middle line with no displacement of the peduncular line. So again, a, 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 an anterior and posterior transpetrosal approach was used in this particular case. And this is the result, the immediate postoperative result with the CT scan pre and postoperative. You see here how there are some edema and the temporal low because of the displacement of this of, of these uh, 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 areas, so the patient had a, a, a critical postoperative immediate uh, uh, recovery, but in the long term follow up, the patient could remove could recover some most of their functions, but actually it was very difficult for her to re, to be reincorporated to her previous activity. So the analysis is summarized in this table. As you can see here, most of the patients belong to group. A, as you 15 cases in, in, uh, and uh, five cases on group B. You see, in group A, most of the clinical manifestations were related to cranial nerve deficits. In contrary, in group B, most of clinical manifestations were related to motor and uh, a, a, a hypercranial, a, 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 a intracranial hypertension. So the quality of life were uh, worst was worse in group B, you see here, in comparison to group A, and total removal and gross total removal was uh, higher on group A. You see how in group A, we, could, we were able to remove 12 out of 15 cases. And in, on contrary, only in one patient on group B, we could remove the tumor completely. In the, most, in the majority of them, unless in our hands, was not possible to offer a total removal on these lesions. And you see here, this is the most important part of the analysis. All patients on group A were able to remove to re be reincorporated to previous activity. In comparison, only two out of five patients on group B were able to, be, uh, to recover his previous condition. So as a conclusion, we can say that there, this, the displacement we analyze the, displace, the, dis, the degree of displacement of the peduncular line is uh, it may give us a, a, an information about the eligibility of the retrosigmoid approach. By analyzing this displacement, we can define two different versions of petroclaval meningiomas. On group A, we could find that tumors were smaller, they are located slightly lateral to the middle line. And the symptoms are mild, most of them related to cranial nerve deficit, deficits, and all of them could be a, a treated by a simple retrosigmoid approach. On the other side, on the other hand, on group B, we have larger tumors that are located more medially with uh, symptoms that are more related to, to, to uh, motor deficit and intracranial hypertension. But, and in those particular cases, it is necessary to consider another more complex approach for the successful removal of those tumors. So our proposal after an analysis, this is small case, this is small number of cases, of course, but uh, uh, we want to say that based on that analysis, we can define two different groups of, of, of real petroclavial meningiomas. On group A, the tumors are located more laterally, and on group B, the tumors are located more medially. 
Considering that these tumors on group A, the insertion, I mean, the implant of the tumor is more ample in the petrous apex than in the clival region, we are proposing to call these patients, this tumor as a real petroclival because the petrous portion of the tumor is more important than the clival one. On the other side, considering that in group B, the, ample, the more ample impl implant of the tumor is in the clival region than in the petrous apex, we are proposing to call these patients as a clival petrosa, given the idea that the clival component of the tumor is more important or more ample than the petrosal one. Of course, our intention is not to change all the ter international accepted terminology on those tumors, but our intention is that by giving just one word, the surgeon will be able to know the, the location of the tumor, the possible size of it, the clinical condition of the patient, and if the retrosigmoid approach can be applicable, and of course, the uh, postoperative prognosis, clinical prognosis of the patients. In this manner, the surgeon can talk to the patient and to the family, to the relatives, about the the, the consideration of the uh, of the postoperative. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the the possible morbidity and even mortality. In the, depending on the complexity of the lesions. We have published our results. We can, you can find it in Operative Neurosurgeon in October to, uh, 2000, 2021. And uh, we, can, uh, we, we uh, propose this uh, classification just to be able to analyze in a surgical perspective these tumors. So thank you again for the invitation. A great honor for me. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm just trying to get myself on screen. There we go. No, that, that's very, very interesting. I absolutely agree with you that most of them can be operated on by the retrosigmoid. In fact, I wonder if perhaps you're underselling the retrosigmoid approach, because one thing you didn't mention was that once you've exenterated the tumor and really you've just got a bit of capsule left, you've been doing this for an hour or two and the brainstem will be gradually coming back and pushing the rest of the tumor into your field. And so I wonder if your the strict limits that you were showing there could maybe be made a little more elastic and, and you could, and you're not having to reach around the corner, the tumor is actually trying to come out. What do you think? Of course, it's a very good point. As, as uh, soon as you, uh, well, when you are removing the tumor, of course, all the structures are recovering in the normal situation. And I agree with you. But, um, uh, well, in our experience, this not happen in, in, in every case. Mostly in the patient, in the tumors that are located rightly behind the clivus. It's uh, the, the, the brainstem is displaced back, backwards, not laterally. So when you are removing the tumor, the brainstem is going into the anterior part of the of the surgical field, but I agree with you. Yeah. In, more, in most in, in most of the cases, uh, the, as as uh, you move, are mobilizing the tumor, the area is uh, uh, pushing the, the the residual tumor to the surgical field. So, but it's impossible to know it, 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 in the preoperative uh, when do you analyze the the, the, the the studies in the preoperative period. But you 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 have the an, an excellent view. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Now we have uh, no more questions from the faculty, but we've got one or two from the floor. Uh, Yuri Longkotovsky, I'm very sorry about that. I have a question to ask Prof Guinto. What do you think about both side retrosigmoid approach in case of oh. medial location of meningioma? <laughs> well, I think it's too much, too much surgery. For, for, <laughs> I agree. For, yeah. Of course, in, in simultaneously case, or to different a different time. <laughs> you could have one, <laughs> one one surgeon on one side and one surgeon on the other side. Yeah, maybe on on plaque meningioma, you can use one side and the other side in a second in a in a different stage. But uh, I have not any case of uh, to 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 apply this bilateral uh, retrosigmoid. But there is no a, a indication. Of course, it depends it depends on the case. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. If there are no yes, other. Uh, questions, I, I have a question and a comment. Uh, this is Dr. Amirat, yes. First of all, I congratulate Dr. Quinto for his very illustrative and very, very, very nice presentation. Uh, I have a comment. I mean, uh, each time that uh, we, I use the retrosigmoid approach, there are two things that are, in my opinion, are 
incredibly important. The first thing is to release CSF from the inferior cerebellopontine system. If you look at uh, the cerebellum vis-a-vis -vis the petrol surface before and after this maneuver, often you find that cerebellum just by draining CSF moves away from the petrous reed, from the posterior part of the petrous pyramid, maybe three, two, three, four, four millimeter. Uh, the second thing is that uh, uh, I use for this type of tumor, I always use uh, the semi-sitting position because the semi-sitting position allows you uh, to change the angle and the height of the, of the approach to the CP angle. So I think that also is, a, is an important, uh, is an important uh, consideration. Yeah. And third thing, I totally agree that uh, the majority of petroclimal tumor, they can be safely removed, you know, with the caveat of meningioma removal through a simple retrosigmoid approach. I used to do a number of pre-sigmoid approaches, but in the last 10 years, I have probably, I have decreased them almost to zero. But thanks again for your nice presentation, Dr. Quinto. Thank you very much, Professor Amirati. I appreciate your comments. Totally agree. I don't use the semi-sitting position because uh, it's very tiring for me to have the, the, the arms like this, but of course, it's an excellent option also. Thank you very much. And the release of the CSF leak, the CSF from the, from the cisterns is mandatory in all, in all those cases. Thank you very much. Thank, well, you. thank you very much, everybody, for, for your comments. I think in the interest of time, we ought to move on. Do we have um, Professor Landiero yet? No. Okay, in which case we'll move on to uh, Ajith Nair from India. Contralateral transmaxillary approach for petroclival meningiomas. Which sounds very interesting. Mr. Nair. Or not. Or not, as the case may be. Do we have Professor Nair? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, just 10 minutes. Oh, yes, there you are. Sorry. Yeah. Just, a, just a minute. Just a minute. Sorry. Hey. Am I uh, audible? Hello. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Perfect. Yep. Yes. Uh, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of my friends across the globe. First of all, I must thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, the question, uh, there's a lot of uh, lectures here. Why the contralateral transmaxillary approach? Because it's a direct approach and uh, it doesn't have to cross, hello, cranial nerves. And uh, uh, we don't have to, uh, as for an endogenous endoscopic approach, we will use the zero degree scope, but we went to uh, have a look in the lateral Posterior to the petrus, we have to use the 45 degree, 30 degree scopes, and uh, so many other instruments are needed. So, all these uh, can be uh, avoided. So, this comes from the uh, thought from the mind of Carlos Steinerman. And uh, you can see uh, it provides excellent access to the coronal plane, especially lesions located laterally behind the uh, uh, petrus uh, carotid. It can overcome many anatomical limitations of the endoscopic endonasal approach, uh, as I have stated. And uh, it, it will give a good visualization of uh, petrous apex and the petroclival region. Sorry.
uh, then we have to de uh, uh, define what is petrus suffix. Petrus suffix is uh, something uh, you see uh, is bounded posterior medially by the posterior fossa dura and the posterior laterally by the internal acoustic meatus, anterior laterally by the horizontal portion of the internal carotid artery, inferiorly by the inferior petrosal sinus and petrocaval syngondrosis. So uh, uh, now we are very familiar with intracranial approaches. And uh, we are also aware of its limitations, uh, posterior by retrosegmoid and far lateral. This has got a narrow corridor. You have to do a lot of cerebellar retraction and it cross seven, eight cranial nerves. And the superior by ID, the petrosectomy and the transpetrous roots. Uh, it has a uh, disadvantage of the same thing. A uh, lot of uh, temporal lobe retraction. And the lateral approach, very difficult. Infracochlear, translab, and posterior petrus. You have to uh, go through the uh, hearing apparatus and uh, there is a chance of hearing loss. So uh, we, we have uh, known the endoscopic endovensal approach, which is a direct approach. Uh, there is no corridor and there is no need to close the cranial nerves. So there is no brain retraction at all. But why contralateral transmaxillary approach? Because endoscopic endovensal approach works in a midline sagittal plane. Orienting and working in a coronal plane is difficult. Working on lesions below the petrous carotid requires resection of the tergopaltian fossa and medial station. Superior lesions of the petrous suffix require angled endoscope and a risky maneuvers like the transposition of the carotid. Now I come to the angle advantage. You can see uh, the petrous suffix, uh, petrous ICA there. It has, uh, we can draw a line through the horizontal petrous and the angle it makes with the, your desired approach is the angle advantage. In the endonasal endoscopic approach, the angle advantage is 42 degree. And when you come to the contralateral transmaxillary approach, after doing anterior maxillectomy and the cardiac leg surgery, the angle will be reduced to almost uh, 25 degree. So, the, uh, uh, so there is a big advantage, big advantage of almost uh, 16 degree, almost a 25 degree advantage because the uh, tra contralateral transmaxillary approach is a very direct approach. Reach advantage is, uh, we all think that this uh, uh, approach, uh, you have to go for a, re a lot of uh, more distance to reach the area of interest than the endoscopic endonasal trajectory. But in fact, the uh, contralateral transmaxillary approach requires a less distance to reach the area of interest. And the, the next thing is the preparation of the endonasal corridor. You have to do as usual, you have to do a medial maxillectomy, you have to do a spinoidectomy, wide right posterior septostomy, and the removal of the spinoid postrum. And uh, when you prepare the contralateral transmaxillary corridor, you have to do a cardinal approach. And uh, you have to uh, uh, go as much lateral as possible because the shaft of the end, uh, to angulate the shaft of the endoscope, the lateral. Uh, removal of the anterior maxillary wall is essential. And uh, this, can, this is well shown in this picture. And uh, about the dissection of the petrous suffix, petrous suffix is divided into superior and inferior portion by imaginary line that runs through the horizontal petrous segment of ICA in the axial plane. The superior portion of the petrous suffix is located posterior to the petrous and paraclival segments of ICA, limited medially by the uh, limited Medially mm -hmm. by the hello, medially by the petrous forces of the spinoid bone and laterally by the Indian uh, artery canal. Inferior portion of the petrous apex is uh, below the petrous IC and posterior to the eustachian tube. It is limited medially by the petroclival synchondrosis and laterally by the jugular foramen. The posterior limit of the entire petrous apex is the posterior fossa dura. This picture shows uh, the important structures. You can see the paraclival ICA and uh, uh, to the uh, left of the paraclival ICA, you can see a star, that a white star, that is an inferior petrosal sinus. And in between the inferior petrosal sinus and the paraclival ICA is uh, uh, the petrous apex. It has got an andro posterior disposition because the uh, inferior petrous sinus is more anteriorly and the paraclavia is posteriorly placed. And inferior to the, that, you can see the petroclavia syncontrosis and the foramen laterum, which is an important structure 
in identifying this uh, uh, in doing this surgery because the foramen laxorum is the area where the vdnr enters the horizontal portion of the uh, petrous ica and uh, lateral to that uh, the petroclavial syngodosis you can see the jugular tubercle jugular tubercle and uh, uh, the petroclavial syngodosis forms the boundaries of the inferior petrous sinus while it entering in the jugular bulb and dissection of the petrous sectors, there are three important structures and one triangle. That is the petrous process of the sphenoid bone, foramen laserum, and the petrocavus synchondrosis. And the triangle is the garnish triangle. You see the petrous process of the sphenoid bone and the garnish triangle. These are the most important structures you know when you uh, uh, dissect this petrous apex. The superior portion, I reiterating, the superior portion of the petrous apex is located posterior superior to the petrous ICA and posterior lateral to the paraclival ICA. The superior portion of the petrous apex is limited medially by the petrous process of the sphenoid bone, which is located between the paraclival ICA anteriorly and the most medial superior portion of the inferior petrosal sinus posteriorly. You should understand that. The uh, inferior petrosal sinus enters the cavernous sinus uh, as well as the petroclavial ICA. So it forms an angle in between, and in between the angle lies the petrous apex, the superior portion of the petrous apex, that is called a sphenoid process of the petrous process of the sphenoid bone. The Indian lacoustic canal is located deep within the superior portion of the petrous apex. You see this picture uh, very well show again the more and more dissection is being done. The inferior petrous sinus is more visible as a white star. Then you can see red dotted and uh, green dotted area. This is the uh, uh, area of the petrous apex, and the uh, uh, superior portion is the area uh, with the red dotted line, and the inferior portion is with the uh, green dotted line. And uh, uh, lateral to that, you can see the jugular tubercle. In between the jugular tubercle and petrous apex, and there's the inferior petrous sinus going into the uh, uh, jugular bulb. And the uh, uh, right side of the picture, you can see the VDA nerve entering the foramen rotundum. And uh, after uh, this is a one important dissection in identifying the uh, in the contralateral transmaxillary approach. After removing the uh, petrosal process of the sphenoid bone, you can see the sixth nerve, which is sixth nerve, which is entering the dorolos canal, and it is uh, posterior and superior. And uh, preservation of the sixth nerve. Uh, depends on the fine dissection we do over the uh, petrosal process of the sphenoid bone. Uh, and uh, other uh, important structure is the petroclavis synchrondosis and foramen lacerum. Inferior portion of the petrous apex is located below the petrous ICA. It is limited. The inferior portion is limited medially by the foramen lacerum, media inferiorly by the petroclavis synchrondosis, and inferiorly by the jugular foramen, and anteriorly by the stretching tube. Inferior petrosal sinus run postro superior to the inferior portion of the petrous apex. Median nerve again is a important landmark in identification of the foramen laserum. You again see is the dissection is going deeper. You can see more structures here. You can see the parapharyngeal ICA. You can see the occipital condyle, the jugular tubercle. In between the jugular tubercle and petrous apex, inferior petrous sinus is going into the uh, jugular fossa. Again, the median nerve and the east station tube, which is anterior to the uh, this structure. The, uh, another key anatomical structure is the foramen laserum. Foramen laserum is the mainly a ventral skull based crossroad from which you can go into the cavernous sinus superiorly, straight away superiorly. If you go superiorly and laterally, you go into the middle force and vector scale. If you go uh, medially, you directly go into the petrous apex and the upper petroclavial fissure. If you go inferiorly, you go into the jugular tubercle and lower clivus. Inferior petroclavial uh, if you go laterally and inferiorly, you go into the jugular fossa. The posterior limits of the petrous apex are uh, posterior fossa dura. Posterior uh, petrous apex is lateral to the inferior petrous sinus. Deeper structures. Uh, drilling the is a very important drilling the superior portion of the petrous apex gives access to the internal acoustic canal. Drilling below the petrous ICA gives access to the posterior genu of the ICA and the jugular foramen. You can see the this is one of the final dissection, and uh, you can see the undersurface of the petrous, where it is written petrous ICA, it is undersurface of the petrous ICA, which is going through the carotid canal, 
and you can see the para pharyngeal icia the white star is the area of the jugular foramen or a jugular bulb and uh, you can see the uh, inferior petrol strands entering the jugular uh, fossa uh, the gardner triangle uh, this is the most important area through which we enter the posterior petrous uh, bone that is the uh, it, it is the abducens nerve superiorly inferior petrol cell sinus medially petroclavial and the petrous segments laterally and uh, uh, jugular foramen inferiorly this anatomic triangle or pyramid of axis provides the medial window into the entire petrous bone the most infralateral portion of the inferior petrosal uh, sinus is located between petrous petrous apex superior and jugular tubercle inferiorly this is the picture of a gardner triangle you can see in the right side uh, there is a, a, a fixed nerve and medially you can petroclavial ic inferiorly you can see the petroclavial synchondrosis and this is a final uh, dissection showing superiorly the sixth nerve and uh, uh, just inferior to that is seven eighth entering the internal acoustic meatus you can see the sixth and lower cranial nerves you can see the cut edge of the Uh, inferior petrosal sinus and under surface of the petrous IC and the parapharyngeal IC. This is one of the case we did uh, through the uh, this approach, and uh, I don't think the video will work. And uh, these are the advantages uh, for uh, contralateral transmaxillary approach. There is no need to mobilize IC. There is no need to perform a transtergoid approach. With the transtergoid approach, can sacrifice median or sphenopalatine artery, etc. No need to. Dissect and sacrifice eustachian tube. There is no uh, it is, uh, angled endoscope and surgical instruments are not needed. It's an average angle is less and the reach angle reach advantages are so more. The advantages are uh, oral and oral fistula, facial sealing, paresthesia, minor cosmetic changes, and nasopharyngeal dysfunction. To conclude, it provides access to petrous apex and domains behind that can avoid carotid mobilization and manipulation of the eustachian tube. It is comparable to anterior open approaches and have some aspects better. Thank you, and thank you for patient listening. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's absolutely fascinating. The feeling I have when listening to a talk like that is that I'm so glad there are people who do this. But I have to say, I'm equally glad I'm not one of them. <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating, um, uh, but it requires such dedication. I have to congratulate you on that. It's really excellent. Now, uh, could we? Could you unshare your screen, please? That's great. Thanks very much. Any questions? Firstly, from faculty, and any other questions? And. That one's not relevant. There's nothing in the question and answers about that. Can I ask you then how how long did it take you to learn this? Number one, number two, do you do it with an ENT surgeon uh, or or a facial maxillary, or do you do it on your own? Yeah, it take almost uh, because uh, uh, we started doing endoscopic endonasal approaches for a long time for our pituitary tumor. Then we gradually moved to the anterior cranial fossa and the transclavial approaches, trans from trans uh, S model approaches, gradually cavernous sinus. And uh, this is the last stage because uh, uh, there are five stages that is uh, described by Pittsburgh group in learning that. So when you go to a coronal plane, you should have a, a more more uh, experience and a more. Uh, 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 this is the most important thing in when you go to coronal uh, is uh, how to handle the carotid, called base carotid. It is a very important because uh, one injury to the carotid is a very uh, stressful thing for a surgeon and it's a very uh, serious thing for the patient. And another example is it is a teamwork because uh, you have to work with the uh, 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 ENT surgeon, but uh, now we call all our skull base surgeon. Because it's a long procedure, sometimes the procedure will take one whole day, and we will keep the patient there for the next day. So there are a lot of drilling. There is a lot of uh, technology involved, and you're and so many things are involved. So it 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 is not, uh, uh, and you have to do a lot of cadaveric dissection. And uh, then one one most beauty of this uh, approach is uh, you you directly land on the tumor, and you don't have any critical or vital structures to close when you do this sort of cases. 
Well, thank you for that. Uh, there's a, a comment on the question and answer saying, excellent presentation, sir. So there you are. <laughs> you thank, have, you, you thank, have, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for time. some features in our slides. So thank <clears> you. <throat> sorry, sorry. Thank, for thank, thank, thank you very much indeed for that. It really, that really was truly fascinating. The dissections are wonderful. Now, can we welcome from Tunisia, uh, Professor Mehdi Darmul, who's going to talk yes. to us on uh, endoscopic endonasal surgery for supracellar meningiomas uh, in some well-selected cases. Mehdi. Okay. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody from all over the world. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee of this uh, webinar for uh, her kind invitation, and especially Professor Nasser El Gandour and Professor Luis Borba, and the moderator, Professor Andre uh, Grothaus, Professor Abster Jenkins, and Professor Alber Alberto Delitala. I will talk about endonasal endoscopic surgery for supracellar meningioma and especially for tuberculum cell meningioma. Surrounding important neurovascular structure is one of the difficulties of the surgical treatment of tuberculum cell meningioma. While traditional transcranial approach such as the pterional, the bifrontal orbitozygomatic and transbasal have proven to be effective at removing these tumors, recent years have shown the evolution and implementation of various mi minimally invasive approaches that benefit from the use of endoscopy such as endoscopic endonasal approach, the subject of our presentation, and the supraorbital keyhole mini craniotomy with endoscopic assistance. These new approaches offer the possibility of reducing brain and nerve retraction, minimizing incision size, and speeding patient recovery. However, these approaches are not suitable for all meningioma in, their, uh, in this location, and uh, many st uh, still benefit from more extensive and more appropriate case, uh, traditional approach. Actually, uh, appropriate uh, case selection and results in large series are lacking. Decision-making and case selection are the keys to successful surgery. Uh, while endoscopic endonasal approach, uh, uh, endonasal approach are uh, well adopted in pituitary adenoma, controversial still remains in tuberculum cell meningioma. It, it is uh, now considered as an excellent alternative to transcranial approach in selected cases. And uh, in uh, recent literature, uh, the subject uh, is uh, very, uh, we, uh, we, we find this subject with comparison of the two techniques. Here, we uh, will show you our, uh, our uh, cases. In the last 11 months, between January 2022 and uh, November 22, we, uh, I operated eight cases of tuberculum cell meningioma, and among the, these cases, I select uh, the four for the endosc endoscopic endonasal uh, approach. They are small, medial, without vessel encasement, and the four other are operated by frontotemporal, uh, frontoperitoneal approach, and we compare, we compare the result of the two uh, groups. Our, we uh, will show our selected case. The first case is about uh, 62 years old female complaining since one year of visual disturbance without uh, endocrine dysfunction. On examination, the visual acuity on the right side was one over 20 and in the left side was four over 10. Uh, in the visual field, we uh, showed the bitemporal quadranopsia and the fundoscopy was normal. And the MRI showed uh, tuberculum cell meningioma, three uh, centimeter in, thi in size. Uh, and uh, th this patient underwent uh, extended endoscopic endonasal approach by monostril approach with the resection of uh, the middle turbinate. Uh, we did extended approach with drilling of the tubercle cell, coagulation and vertical opening of the dura and we uh, start with internal debulking of the meningioma and capsular dissection, and we obtain a gross total resection. And the length of the operation or, uh, was uh, two, uh, about two hours. Uh, the estimated blood, uh, blood loss, uh, the average estimated is about 150, uh, 150 milliliter, and uh, 
in the at the end of the operation, we did multi-layer construction of the skull base without uh, lumbar drainage. And uh, I will show you video of one of this. Uh, Here, the debarking of the tumor from the endonasal approach. And this is at the end of the operation. We uh, can see the complete removal of the meningioma, and we can see the uh, cerebral, both the, the anterior cerebral artery and anterior committing, committing can artery. I, can I interrupt? We can't actually see that. Um, ah. Can you try putting it onto slideshow? Can it, you, you can see? You can see that? We can't see your video. Uh, okay, thank you. This is the, the end of the operation, uh, confirming the uh, complete removal of the meningioma. Your screen is frozen, uh, Dr. Mehdi. Okay, I, I will, uh, okay. Possibly exit and start again, but don't help. Excuse me. No. Okay. The second case is about uh, you. You see, you can see now the screen. Yes, yes. The, it's uh, just the video. Uh, is there any okay. the videos that we can't see? Okay, okay. Uh, sorry, sorry for the. The second case is about a 44 year, years old female complaining since six months of visual disturbance. And on examination, we uh, find uh, uh, visual acuity on the right side, uh, two over 10, and the, in the left side, six over, uh, over 10. And in the fondoscopy, uh, papilledema stage two. Uh, and uh, the laboratory uh, showed the hypocorticism. And in the MRI, we, uh, on the uh, axial, coronal, and uh, sagittal, we uh, showed uh, tuberculum cell meningioma size three centimeter with the, the dural tail without uh, vascular encasement. This patient underwent endoscopic condonasal approach by mononostril, and we uh, did subtotal removal because of fibrous consistency. The length of operation was about two hours, and uh, the estimated blood loss is about 100 milliliters. And at the end, we did also multilayer reconstruction of the skull base. The outcome, uh, uh, in the outcome, there is no CSF leak. The visual symptoms are stable, and uh, we show transit uh, diabetes insipid with hypopituitarism. The third case is a, is a 26 years old male complaining since, since one year of visual disturbance with recent rap rapid worsening. On examination, the visual acuity uh, on the right uh, eye. Uh, he count the fingers at two meters and uh, two over 10 in the left eye. And the visual field showed by temporal hemianopsia, uh, the fondoscopy was normal. And the MRI showed the I mean, uh, on axial, coronal, and uh, sagittal, the tuberculum cell meningioma. He underwent surgery by endonasal endoscopic approach, by, by, by nostril approach, and we obtained total removal of the, the lesion. Uh, the length of operation is about two hours. The blood loss uh, 50 milliliters. And uh, at the end, we did multilayer reconstruction of the skull base without number drainage. And uh, the outcome is very good. There is no CSF leak. Uh, and we obtain a rapid improvement of visual symptom. Uh, acuity become 10 over 10 in both eyes. And the uh, visual field was normal. And uh, uh, this is the early CT scan in the uh, first postoperative day showing the complete removal of the lesion. The fourth case is about a 48 years old female complaining since, since eight months of visual disturbance. On examination, the visual acuity is at four over 10 in the right side and six over 10 in the left side. And the visual field showed by temporal emianopsia 
and the fundoscopy was normal. The MRI showed this small tuberculum salamine angioma without vascular encasement. And she was operated by endoscopy nasal approach by monosteril with total removal. And the length of operation was uh, about two hours and 30 minutes and the average blood loss about 150 milliliter. And uh, also we did multilayer reconstruction uh, at the end of the uh, intervention without the lumbar drainage. And the outcome is very good. And uh, without diabetes CP, we, we, uh, uh, with improvement of visual acuity. Uh, we will compare the, the two groups, uh, endonasal on, uh, endoscopic approach and transcranial approach. For the number is the same, for the, the gender, no difference. The age is almost the same, the comorbidity also, but the symptom one set is 10 months for the first group and 19 months for the second group. For the symptom, uh, almost the same, uh, especially visual disturbance and uh, headache. For the preoperative imaging, the tumor size was less in the first group. And uh, the sphenoid sinus pneumatization, we uh, found uh, cellar uh, uh, pneumatization uh, more in the, in the first group. And the pituitary stalk deviation was more deviated in the second group. This is the case that uh, we operate via transcranial approach, the first case of menage, tubercular salaminangioma, the sixth case, the third case, and the fourth case, a small one, but deviated to the right side. And uh, comparing the, the surgery, the complete removal and, uh, is the same in the, uh, both groups, but the mean length of operation is short in the first group of endoscopic condonasal approach, and the average blood loss is uh, uh, lower in the first group. And the post-operative imaging, uh, showed the uh, quality of uh, resection the same in both groups. This is uh, uh, post-operative imaging, pre-operative and post-operative of the uh, second group, uh, complete resection, and another case with the complete uh, resection of the, of the lesion. The post-operative outcome is uh, in the first group, we uh, we found uh, the visual symptoms uh, were more improved in the first group, and uh, the complication is the, the same, but the mean postoperative hospital stay is shorter in the first group than the second group. We review the recent li literature. There is uh, many uh, paper, but uh, we select the, the recent one. This is a decision-making algorithm for minimally invasive approach to enter scalp based meningioma, and the, in the algorithm, uh, if there is lateral extension, we cannot do the endoscopic nasal approach. There is another uh, paper, selection of endoscopic or transcranial surgery for tubercular cell angioma containing a specific anatomical feature, retrospective multicenter analysis, surgical management of tubercular cell angioma, transcranial approach or endoscopic nasal approach, the expanded endoscopic nasal approach for treatment of tuberculum cell angioma in a series of 40 consecutive cases, skull based approach for tuberculum cell angioma and sessional experience in a series of 34 patients, outcome after transcranial and endoscopic nasal approach for tubercular, tuberculum angioma, retrospective comparison. Limits of endoscopic transnasal transtubercular approach, extended endoscopic transphenoidal approach for tubercular salaminangioma, endoscopic surgery for tubercular salaminangioma, other, other uh, articles. And the conclusion after the review of the recent literature and uh, the result of our small series that the endoscopic endonasal uh, approach represents a good surgical alternative in well selected uh, tuberculum salaminangioma. Uh, which offer a better visual improvement with speed recovery. The endoscopic endonasal approach has the adv advantages to uh, attack the du dura uh, initially, which is coagulated, uh, that lead to low, low blood loss and can uh, offer gross total resection with excision of the lesion uh, of the dura attachment and involved bone. And we can obtain symptom one removal uh, by this approach. Uh, by uh, approaching the, the tumor by below, we, there is no manipulation of optic nerve and the perforating vessel, uh, which lead to better visual improvement. And uh, there is no manipulation of frontal lobe, no olfactory damage, no cortical damage, no seizure, and uh, uh, there is a reduction of hospital stay. 
And the more the literature, the, the, there are more CSF leak than transcranial approach, and uh, they recommend multi-layer reconstruction with lumbar drainage, which can be kept uh, to uh, either to five days. The limits of the, this approach is the huge meningioma, the lateral extension, vessel encasement, and the firm tumor consistency. The endoscopy condonasal approach requires excellent training skills and uh, experience, which can be uh, obtained after a long, progressive, and sure learning curve. Uh, taking home message, uh, message uh, endoscopic uh, uh, endonasal approach is suitable, more suitable for small tuberculum cell meningioma for deep extension to cellar area or into the optic canal without the vessel encasement and in case of soft consistency is offer a visual improvement with speed recovery for the patient. Uh, whereas the transcranial approach uh, remains the gold standard approach for all cases of meningioma, especially for the huge one in case of vessel encasement and lateral extension and for consistency. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed for a very nice presentation. Um, I think the small numbers don't matter as long as the results are very good, which they clearly are. And I think you've given a very good rationale for choosing one approach over the other. One thing I would say is, is that you, one of the main things that you said as a criterion for choosing this approach, or, or one that would not limit you on using this approach, was vessel encasement. And yes, you can see very often, uh, especially if you use multiplanar imaging, you can be fairly certain whether there's vessel encasement. But can you be sure there's not vessel adhesion, particularly with the small vessels, meningo, uh, not meningo, uh, spear hypophyseal arteries, etc., things that are very small but very vital for vision? How, how do you assess that when you're looking at the MRI? For, for our cases, we select the small one without vessel encasement, and we, we don't see any vessel encasement uh, from the endonasal approach. I'm sorry, what, what I was asking was how do you, how can you be sure that there is no vessel adhesion to the tumor, not necessarily encasement? Uh, the, the, the meningium I just did an, an hour or two back there. Uh, everything very nicely separate, but one vessel absolutely stuck to the tumor, not encased in it, but just stuck to it. If I'd simply pulled that out, as you often end up doing with a, a transnasal approach, then that, that vessel would definitely have bled. And if it was a superior hypophyseal artery, it, you may end up with, with uh, poor vision. I just wonder how you, how, you can, how you can be sure before you start that there's no vessel adherence. In some cases, yes, uh, it is difficult to, to, to see the, the mm. adherence in some cases. Have you have you had any problems with that, with unexpected no, bleeding? No, 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 no. No. Okay, thank you very much. There's one question from the floor. Uh, do you always use a mononostral approach? Does it make it a bit difficult to move instruments through the same nostril? That's from Dr. Harshad Parekh. In, in, in one case, we did the binostral approach for the U de Juan. And in the other, we did all by uh, mononostral approach. Yeah. We have not any difficulty. It is interesting that the, the, the mantra of the uh, Pittsburgh people is four hands, two nostrils, isn't it? But you yes. haven't found that necessary. Any other questions at all? May I say something? Please, Luis. Hello. <laughs> always amusing, always controversial. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you know, it's difficult to understand why come extra dural for intradural lesions? If you are used to do transcranial approach to meningioma, you see to have the, the big mass and the small babies around. It's, a, it's tumor also. In always there is a vessel that is attached to the wall of the tumor. Mm. When you come from below, the last thing that you see is, is there's vessels, the vessels. Yeah. are the vessels well that was so really this, my question use, as well yes i use the, the the expression to say pull and pray because they pull through the nose and pray to see if any vessel is coming and start to bleed see 
And I make a question to all of you. What's the problem of the microsurgical technique for this small meningioma in tuberculum cella in this area and in the anterior fossa? What's the problem? If you use the cistern, you do the microsurgical techniques, you use short instruments. What is the problem? Why change? Why well, today a lot, a lot of people is afraid to open their head? That's as, as, as I think, as I think you know, you're, you're speaking, you're speaking my language certainly. Uh, but I think one yeah, of the yeah. things that I always get told is that it's because of driving license. You know, the the, the craniotomy from, from below is not counted as a craniotomy. Mm -hmm, exactly. And to be to be fair, there is pretty much zero inf uh, incidence of epilepsy, which is the only reason for limiting people. But yeah, I I I, I agree with you, and I have to say I do most of them that way. Pro uh, comments, Professor Darmo. Yeah. Uh, the transcranial approach uh, remains the gold standard for all the uh, tuberculum cell meningioma, but. Uh, by below uh, for the small one we can uh, speed the recovery of the patient and there is no uh, opening of the skull unless they have to be in hospital for a week with a csf leak <laughs> i have a comment can i share this yes he raised his hand already a long time yeah thank you thank you very much i'm dr najar from syria uh, actually i will make it easy for you professor borba that's it. When we make our approach from down uh, the skull, we change the, all the anatomy. And we are, to be uh, to be honest, that we are learning about maybe and practicing more than 20 years from the uh, micro neurosurgical perspective. Uh, we, we want to see, we like to see every day the uh, carotid artery from above and to see the optic nerve and to open the cistern, to see arachnoid and to make the, to open the, the sylvian fissure. And we educate this, uh, philosophy to our residents now to put an endoscope in the skull base and uh, like uh, Professor uh, Porba said to uh, to pull and the brain and back and the brain and it would you can see but you cannot control what you see yeah maybe we accept uh, we all accept the transferodal uh, tumors for for pituitary uh, hypo, uh, <coughs> surgery because it's simple on the midline but when you are shifted from the midline lateral to the carotid we we almost lost so this is special uh, uh, a special special issue that we do not practice and really it's dangerous to be there and really it's not to refuse something new but we are uh, uh, struggling against something we, we we change the anatomy and changing the approach and changing the whole philosophy of practicing that is the the, the, the point that i see thank you very much Sorry, we have a comment here again from Dr. Harshad Parek. In our experience, it's always safe and easy to go transcranial from meningioma. Only advantage of transnasal is less chance of visual deterioration. I think that's, uh, that's reasonably fair. Well, I think we'll move on. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, little bit of controversy, which is always a good thing. And now I, I don't know if we have Professor Landiero from Brazil yet. If not... Uh, we'll give him some extra time to arrive. We'll move on to Hisham Bassioni from Germany, who's going to talk about anterior skull basement in Germany in general, personal perspective and experience. Hisham. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nasser and uh, uh, Louis Borba, for this educational marathon you are doing. Uh, Professor Nasser Ganduris, I think it is one and a half years now you're doing this marathon and thank you very much. And it's uh, very informative and uh, very useful. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, your invitation. Um, I'm going to share my slides now. I hope you can see it. takes a bit uh, for the for the full screen so my topic is uh, about um, it's my personal perspective but it covers many of the points uh, which were all already discussed um, and um, it's my personal perspective and experience with the um, anterior um, skull based meningiomas um, 
So the um, anterior skull based meningiomas, uh, especially olfactory meningiomas, planus menodale meningiomas, or com combination of both, uh, they are uh, met very often and they are considered um, one of the most common sites of uh, skull based meningiomas, maybe superseded only by sphenoid wing meningiomas. Uh, so what is the treatment goal? The, the treatment goal is a complete resection, uh, which uh, includes the involved dura in the bone, um, according to a Simpson grade one resection. And this should be done at the first surgery, which is the best uh, chance to have a complete resection. And you want to preserve, uh, fully preserve any pre-existing function and life quality. And this includes, of course, uh, smelling um, and vision. Um, we have to remember also that um, ionizing radiation. So if you are, um, have the philosophy, I'm removing most of the tumor and leaving a bit of the tumor for radiation. And then ionizing radiation is for sure uh, uh, an environmental risk factor most strongly associated with meningiomas. So always try to avoid radiation in grades one, and I would say also in grade two tumors. Grade three is another issue. And um, of course, we, I think we all agree that um, radiation should be done uh, postoperatively. So historically, the first successful uh, resection of an olfactory groove meningioma was performed by the Italian surgeon and also politician Francesco Durante in 1885 by a left frontal craniotomy. And you see here um, an image from the um, book of a German pioneer, uh, Fedor Krause, a world-renowned neurosurgeon at that time. Uh, and the usual uh, approach was um, a subfrontal approach. And as you can see here, also the, um, the bone flap was left on the soft tissue um, uh, at that time. At that time. So what are the, um, is, um, the surgical anatomy and the structures in danger? Uh, first, to begin with the nerve structures. Um, of course, the frontal lobes, which are not depicted in this image, um, but they should be handled with much care because they are already, especially in the large and giant tumors, they are already compressed. And if you add an edema on this, then they are very delicate and very, very vulnerable. And you've got the olfactory nerves uh, we were already discussing with the bulb, the tracts, uh, which should be preserved if, um, if not uh, involved uh, by the tumor. And you've got the optic nerve and the chiasma more posteriorly as the nervous structures. So the vascular structures, uh, this is the A1 and A2 segment of the anterior cerebral artery, the ACOM, and of course the ophthalmic artery entering the optic canal. Um, we are not performing um, um, angiography or DSA anymore routinely in these uh, tumors. Uh, we are, for, for the, the vascular anatomy, we're using the MRI and you can see it quite well, but in the traditional um, um, angiography, you can see the, um, the vessels which are um, dislocated by large tumors, and you can see very well the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries coming from the base or, or and originating from the ophthalmic um, artery, uh, and which are considered the main nutritional, vascular nutrition of the tumor. In addition, of course, in large tumors, you've got a, a peel vascularization also. So um, in other structures um, you have to take care about, we uh, already discussed the problem of CSF leak. So you have to take care about the frontal sinus and the cribriform uh, plate, and of course the ethmoidal air cells. These are the most common sites of CSF leak. Of course, you have to um, have to consider the individual anatomy of the patient. There are patients very, very very large aeration of the frontal sinus. There are patients with a very thick uh, frontal bone. So this ha you have to consider if you're going to plan the approach. So what are the most um, uh, common approaches? Um, um, we already said the bifrontal, subfrontal approach with or without uh, orbital osteotomy. The frontal lateral approaches, um, including the 
minimal invasive um, or keyhole supraorbital approach. And um, the pteronal, pteronal, um, traditional pteronal approach uh, as the posterior lateral approach. We've got the bifrontal um, interhemispheric approach without opening the frontal sinus. And of course, the um, what we just heard, the endoscopic uh, endonasal approach. So what is my personal preference? I'm um, maybe I'm a bit traditional uh, because um, I like the anterior midline approach, um, the bifrontal subfrontal approach, and the bifrontal interhemispheric approach without opening the uh, frontal sinus. And for the more posterior located tumors, I uh, prefer the pteronal approach, which includes also the planum uh, and uh, tubercum cellum in the tumors. So what are the reasons for this uh, preference? Usually these uh, tumors are um, have a midline and bilateral presentation. They may be asymmetric, but they usually are on both sides. And uh, do, uh, when they are presented, they are often large and giant. And a very important point is that I would say, according to my experience, um, that there is um, the on plaque growth is the rule rather than the exception. And that's what uh, we just call the babies. Um, and you've got a very good overview on the frontal base. Uh, you have a very good overview on the hyperstosis, which should be removed. Uh, uh, you uh, get uh, to the vascularization very early. Uh, you can preserve uh, the olfactory nerves if uh, they can be preserved. And uh, you can see bilaterally the optic nerves and canals and open the optic canals if it is necessary. Um, one important aspect um, is, um, I think, the depth of, which is uh, very rarely talked about, the depth of the cribriform plate. And there's an old study, uh, this can be very deep. Um, and uh, this, um, and according to this study, anteriorly it can be up to 1.6 centimeters and more posteriorly up to one centimeter. So this is, there's a very uh, deep um, uh, valley where you have to remove the tumor. So this is an obstacle if you come from a lateralized approach, like like the frontal uh, frontal um, uh, lateral approach or the um, keyhole approach, uh, the supraorbital. Um, we, we had in, in in our study we had uh, often the um, case of and a tumor invasion of the optic canal, especially in the large uh, tumors, uh, which cannot um, or which must not be seen on the MRI uh, preoperatively. So you have to take care about this. And coming from uh, bifrontal, you have a good overview and you can open both of the canal if it is necessary uh, to remove tumor in there. Uh, you have a very good vascularized uh, pericranial flap uh, where you can uh, put the, this graft and seal uh, the frontal base, including the frontal sinus. But there are also drawbacks of this uh, approach. You um, Usually you're entering the uh, frontal sinus and you have the chance to or the risk to get a mucus seal afterwards. Um, this happened to me once. Uh, usually can, you can prevent this, but uh, actually it happened once. Um, so um, also there is a late observation of important structures, which is the optic nerves and the anterior cerebral arteries. So maybe in large tumors, you're already uh, tired and uh, then you come to very important structures. Um, this is one example, a 51-year-old woman. She had a giant frontal um, uh, skull-based meningioma. It, it is considered a hollow uh, frontal uh, skull-based meningioma because it includes the olfactory groove. It includes the um, planum sphenoidale. And she presented clinically with blindness, almost blindness on the right uh, eye. And you can see this calcification on the CT scan. And you can see this hyperostosis uh, on the um, um, reformatted uh, bone window, the CT scan. So this is the, the tumor on the MRI. And you, if you look closely, then you can see that there is also an infiltration 
uh, of this hyperostosis. So this is um, actually, it's this contrast uptaking, and this is tumor uh, infiltration. And if you see on the coronal uh, image, then you can see also the tumor entering the optic canals on both sides. So this you have to consider, and if you um, want to achieve a complete tumor removal, you have to address these, uh, these um, um, tumor extensions. So this is the tumor on the left side, this left optic, optic nerve, um, which was compressed by the tumor, but it was um, uh, quite good separated. This is the hyperostosis. Uh, in, in my view, you have always to remove this hyperostosis um, because uh, you cannot guarantee that it is not infiltrated by the tumor. So this is the right optic nerve, the, the one which is on the, on the almost blind eye, which is much more involved than on the left side. And you can see here that the, the, there's also rarification of vascularization of the nerve and also indentation um, of the nerve by uh, the tumor. So this uh, nerve is, uh, is uh, obviously more pale than on the other side. So uh, of course you have to take care of the um, uh, vessels. This is the um, ACOM, this is the A1 on both sides. And you have uh, to take care not to tear these very small twigs coming from these uh, vessels in order not to have a bleeding, and which, is, uh, which can be very difficult uh, to, to handle um, and which uh, also increase the risk of having uh, an infarction. This is the uh, optic chiasm here. On, and this is the, these are the optic nerves on both sides. This is lamina terminalis. This is still tumor on the base, which has then uh, remo be, uh, been removed. And this is the pituitary stalk, uh, which is usually protected uh, with an arachnoid sheath. Um, so I know that uh, or I knew from the preoperative MRI that uh, the tumor is going into the optic canals. So I'm opening the optic canals in this um, patient. And you see here that there is a tumor in the optic uh, canal, which has to be removed. This is important because uh, tumors or recurrences in these sites uh, are very, uh, yeah, uh, not, not easy to handle. This is the post-operative MRI after surgery, and this is the um, post-operative CT scan. You see that the hyperostosis has been completely removed. This is the patient uh, six months after surgery. Uh, she had no uh, deficits, and this was the vision before surgery, uh, almost uh, blind, and um, this was two months after surgery, and um, this was six months after surgery, so, so she regained vision um, again on the, on the right side. Also, the left side, which was less involved, um, was, um, was much better. Um, and uh, after surgery, excuse me, I'm just uh, closing the window. It's a rare occasion to have sun uh, in Germany at these days, but uh, now it came out. It's, it's good. Um, this is another case, uh, I think, very interesting and also um, contributing to our discussion. Uh, this is a 65-year-old woman. She had weight gain, muscle twitching on the face, neck, and right arm, which we could not explain. But more specifically, she had right anosmia and, um, and left hyposmia, and was otherwise uh, uh, unremarkable. And this is the tumor here. It's not a very large tumor. It's uh, strictly midline here. Um, and also on the posterior aspect, it is midline. So it, is, it lends itself uh, to, for the endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, you can see here what I said, very deep uh, cribriform uh, plate. So it's difficult in my view, even if you, if you take an, 
the endoscope um, uh, for controlling or, or assisting, it's very uh, difficult to get tumor out of these uh, sites. Um, so I, I think the midline approach is more, more uh, advantageous in, in these cases. And you can see that the olfactory nerve on the left side is, uh, is intact while on the right side uh, where she had anosmia is uh, in, uh, probably uh, infiltrated. So this is the positioning of the patient. And this is, uh, I used in this patient, I used the front and interhemispheric approach without opening the frontal sinus. Uh, so cutting the most anterior, most basal, most basal um, uh, falx cerebri. This is a tumor, it is a soft tumor. So I'm I'm not using any um, any spatula or, or fixed retraction in these uh, cases. I just use a CSF regress. This is the uh, olfactory nerve um, on the left side, which is uh, which is intact and it uh, was kept intact. And this is uh, the olfactory nerve on the right side. So you see that this is actually infiltrated by the tumor. Um, so it can, if you want to achieve a complete resection, it cannot be, um, it cannot be um, uh, preserved and uh, she's already anosmic on this side. So these are also the vessels, very uh, important to preserve these vessels and only to uh, coagulate um, and, um, and uh, dissect the, the, and these are the, the uh, satellites. You would not expect on the preoperative MRI. This is the optic nerve uh, here, and this is was lateral to the optic nerve uh, was this tumor. So this is the on plaque growth, which you can even with the best quality MRI, you cannot uh, at least at these times you cannot uh, um, uh, see. So this has to be treated if you want to have an, a complete tumor resection. Also, the infiltrated um, uh, dura uh, or the dura matrix, and this is covering uh, the cribriform uh, plate and uh, closing. And this is the uh, vascularized flap, which is uh, put for sealing the anterior cranial fossa. So, this is the post operative uh, CT scan, supra uh, frontal uh, approach, interhemispheric approach without entering. And this is the MRI uh, post-operatively showing a complete tumor uh, resection. This is the patient with a, with a good also cosmetic result, which is uh, important to consider also. That's an, another interesting case. A 72-year-old man who had a syncope, and, um, um, which was an incidental finding, and he had right um, hyposmia. Uh, not a large tumor, and in this case, I used a, um, um, a supraorbital keyhole approach. I'm going to run this video because you probably know the technique. Um, uh, during craniotomy, the the uh, dura was opened, and it's very important to have. Uh, to remove these um, irregularities, bony irregularities on the frontal um, base uh, to have a better view on the tumor. And then uh, same technique coming from the base of the tumor, interrupting the vascularization. You have uh, here the a nice uh, arachnoid dissection plane uh, to the optic nerve. Uh, so you keep it and preserve the, the optic nerve and then uh, remove this uh, tumor. So this is the, these are also these satellites again. You, you would not expect it, but you have to treat these on plaque uh, tumor um, areas and um, in order to prevent um, um, a recurrence. In this case, I did not open the um, uh, optic canals. You always have to think uh, what step is necessary in order to also reduce the risk for the patient. And then this, uh, this is the um, endoscopic uh, control. 
optic nerve on both sides. And after complete uh, uh, tumor removal, and this is the olfactory nerve here. You have to take care not to stretch it, um, as uh, I said also in, the, in our discussion, and this is closing. Um, so this is pre and post operative. And uh, interestingly, this uh, tumor was a great two uh, tumor. So I think what it was necessary to remove it. Um, and this is the bone window CT scan uh, post operative. So this is the patient, um, I think a good um, um, post-operative result. I'm using a, um, an incision in the eyebrow, not supra or palpebral, uh, and it gives a good um, um, uh, cosmetic result. And it did not until yet uh, observe any alopecia in, this, uh, in these sites. So what uh, the summary and the take home messages according to approach, function, recurrence prevention, and Complica complication avoidance first. Um, um, I was would always uh, look for the most simple approaches. Um, I'm not using retractors. And uh, also, as already said, I'm not using any orbiter to me. And I think we can do a good job with um, the standard neurosurgical approaches, uh, with the uh, so-called traditional neurosurgical approaches. However, the approach should be individualized. You have to consider tumor factors, extent, hyperstosis. Clinically, if olfaction, uh, if, if there's a chance to pre uh, pre preserve olfaction, and of course, also anatomic factors, as, uh, as I showed uh, the frontal sinus, uh, uh, large aeration, uh, and the depth of the cribriform plate. Yeah. According to fun function, um, uh, there are two main um, issues, which is olfaction, vision, and uh, also mental, especially in the large uh, tumors with uh, bifrontal edema. People, uh, if patients often are presenting with mental deficits. And uh, I think you should uh, and can also um, um, prevent any new deficits or increasing deficits. And you have to respect the arachnoid membranes and in the planes, dissection planes, um, uh, um, in order to, to keep it preserving or covering the, the, uh, the, um, the tissue want to, to preserve. Okay. Uh, recurrence, I think very important is um, that um, this on plaque growth, uh, which um, as I said, is uh, the rule rather than the exception in these tumors in my experience, um, and um, so I think an overview on this um, intradural pathology is better than to come from <clears throat> from uh, from an underview um, because you will probably miss these satellites or so-called babies. And um, you have to also remember that these, especially large tumors, are encroaching into the optic canals, and so you have to address uh, this, and this should be a, a part of the procedure. And of course, you have to remove the hyperostosis um, in order to prevent um, any um, late recurrence. And they surely come. They take years, but uh, they come uh, for quite surely. Uh, prevent um, complications. You have to, as I said, uh, re respect the arachnoid uh, membranes and, of course, treat any potential CSF uh, leak sites like the olfactory group and uh, the vascularized periost you gain during this approach is the best natural sealing material, in my, uh, in my view. Um, of course, you should not all not pull on any tumor parts in order to avoid vascular tears in this very small twigs uh, from the peel um, vascularization. And thank you for your invitation and attention. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Hasham. It's again nice to hear 
the variety of approaches and tailoring the approach to suit that individual and the individual's tumor. Also nice to hear someone else who likes the anterior and interhemispheric approach and realizes it can be done above the sinuses. I've seen so many people cut that down to the base and have to repair the sinus. And of course, you want you actually want it to be high. Don't you? You don't. You don't want it to be low at all. I did like the the thing you said when uh, in the nineteen uh, the eighteen eighty five operation that at that time they left the bone flap on soft tissue. I can tell you, a hundred years later, when I was halfway through my training in nineteen eighty five, we still did that. It took us a long time to learn that it was completely unnecessary. So, um, opening to any questions from the floor. Um, Harshad Parekh, who had also left his microphone on, uh, do you always, I can't read this, do you always something bifrontal craniotomy for tumors on either side? And how many times could you save olfactory function? Um, do you, do you always, advise, that's what it's meant to be, do you advise always bifrontal craniotomy for tumors? For these tumors, mm, it, it depends because I showed you other cases um, um, where, for <clears> example, <throat> the the mini uh, supraorbital craniotomy is, uh, I think, um, is is quite good. Uh, but in very large tumors, especially in the in the in the hollow um, uh, anterior skull based tumors, which are which which you need already when you're doing the 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 um, craniotomy, the frontal craniotomy. Uh, there may be a very extremely thin layer or even only an arachnoid covering uh, the tumor anteriorly, then this is, I think, um, the best approach. And um, um, you do not, you, you are just decompressing or you have devascularization of the tumor and decompressing the tumor and you gain more and more space. So you do not need any retractors uh, for this. Do not need to compress the frontal lobes um, and um, or, or elevate the frontal lobes um, because that's you can re do it with microsurgical technique and um, uh, so this is um, um, I'm I'm not dogmatic I'm not uh, using always uh, one approach but um, I'm individualizing it but uh, I think this approach there are preferences. And I, I uh, think it's uh, it's a good approach, especially to have an overview on the frontal base, because uh, to address also the uh, the uh, satellites, uh, the on plaque uh, satellites of the tumor. Well, the mid frontal, the the interhemispheric, I, I still do a bilateral small, just a small box craniotomy, but I only open one side of the dura because I found that splitting the falcs gave me absolutely no advantage at all. By the time I was another five centimeters in there, it really didn't help the trajectory at all, even for the epsilateral optic nerve, because it, I found that I was pretty much in the set in the midline anyway. Do you have any observations on that? You can do it um, uh, sub -falcial. You can remove uh, the tumor under the falcs. Yes, you can do it. Um, it gives you just more um, more vision, actually. If you are opening on one side of the falx and leaving it at the Krista Galli attached, um, uh, I had no uh, no problems with a division of the falx at the at the most anterior part, the Krista Galli. Um, I had no venous complications. In oh no, I don't. I don't think you get complications of it. It's just that I, I just gave it up because I, it I got gives bored. It gives you more. <laughs> I bore more, easily. More. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, you have um, at least um, or in in the further surgery you have a more complete overview on on both sides of the anterior um, uh, skull base. I, I in, in in the especially in the large tumors. There are asymmetric tumors. I did not show. Um, case because of the time there are uh, tumors which are very asymmetric you have a major bulk on one side and just uh, some tumor on the other side i'm doing it also from a unilateral approach so it does not need a bilateral approach yeah um two questions again from the floor what are your experiences with recurrent olfactory groovement in germans recurrences are... excuse me 
And your pearls of wisdom, they also ask for. We have just had all those. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I think um, you can prevent recurrence in these tumors when you're doing the first surgery properly. Yeah. That's my belief. So I, you I must say, I've had some very, very late recurrences sometimes yes. actually yes. in the optic canal or or maybe, the maybe it, as you say those tiny disease. Mm -hmm. yeah maybe even uh, i i've seen uh, recurrences uh, not in my surgery but uh, 20 years uh, yeah. after doing the first surgery um, but if you analyze these cases uh, first in the recurrences there is a more um, a chance that it crosses the cribriform plate and it goes endonasally. Yeah, and this uh, this is um, much more difficult to handle and much more risky for um, a CSF leak. Yeah. Um, I think the recurrences, and I just saw last week a, a case where, I, I don't know why, but the surgeons are afraid to remove the hybristosis. Um, okay. Uh, so, and this was a young man, uh, this was uh, resected five years ago, and now you see the carpet of tumor on the hybristosis coming again. Yeah. So, um, I think this is a very important uh, point that you have to remove the hybristosis, you have to remove, um, I'm not talking about doing something aggressively, but you have yeah. to uh, to remove the dural matrix of the tumor at least coagulate very carefully if there is a risk of, of surrounding structures um, but uh, but you have to handle or you have to address these sites of tumor and also any involved bone and you have to take care about uh, infiltration or a tumor entering the optic canals which is uh, very often which which is not a rare occurrence it's it's quite often uh, seen yeah I agree with that. And um, Suhail Ahmed asking, what about your experience in embolization in these meningiomas? I know what I think about that. Let's hear what you think. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not using embolization no. at all, even if in the so-called hemangioparasitoma, which can be very, very similar to the meningioma in these uh, sites. Um, no, I, I think embolization is, uh, is not necessary. I think the other thing is that I, I gave up even thinking about embolization in nearly all skull-based tumors wow. because it simply never turned out to be possible. Either there was nothing obvious to embolize or else it was a vessel that was feeding too many other things anyway. Because, because um, the, the, uh, the, um, the main vascularization of the tumor is coming actually from the of, uh, of, uh, thalmic artery. So yep. if you want to uh, embolize this, you have a risk of getting a blindness, which of course is would be yep. a catastrophe in, in the patient. Exactly. So um, and you can you can address this uh, by going underneath the tumor and um, and uh, yeah, getting these vessels or the vascularization from from the skull base very early during the surgery. Well, devascularize, uh, devascularizing yes. the tumor yes. first and is even, even fantastic the... because then you've got a dead tumor to take out and it doesn't bleed. It's wonderful. Exactly. And Andre, also, I, I heard you, I, sorry, uh, sorry, Pisham. Um, also, the consistency of the tumor becomes more easy to remove if you devascularize it, the consistency itself. Absolutely. Andre, okay. uh, you've appeared... Do you wish to speak? Yeah, yeah. I, I, just when I heard that, uh, I have to say that um, um, when I trained, I was starting in the 70s and then in the 80s, uh, we only had CT scan, no MRI scan, and we always did angio, angiogram in the meningioma. And then you saw usually there's very strong blush. <laughs> that was the time when people were thinking about embolization. Mm -hmm. And I've stopped doing that after a very well, sad case that I remember of a huge planum spinovidal or factory groove meningioma. That lady which had an angiogram and then they said, oh, we can also embolize it. She had some visual difficulties. After the embolization, her vision was very bad. She could mm -hmm. only see. Mm -hmm. And I also made a judgment mistake because I thought, oh my God, 
I need to decompress those optic nerves immediately and started in the late afternoon removing that big meningioma. And after that surgery, she was completely blind and yeah. stayed blind forever. I probably should have waited and given her some steroids and because this was also um, effect of what I later on said, 1.1 liter of contrast uh, fluid that they used for the procedure. Mm. So yeah. no, I, that, that, that's really, it was, it was not easier at all. And mm -hmm. we completely stopped doing that. And I talk now about the late 80s. So that's uh, yeah. a long time. We don't embolize yes. at all. You get the occasional meningioma where you can see on the MR great big funnel vessels going into it. And then obviously you do want to do embolization. I had a case that sounds a little like yours, but a much better outcome, uh, Andre, um, when it was just a convexity meningioma, and we're fed by the minimum NGO, it was embolized. And I had to come in in the middle of the night to take the damn thing out because it had the whole tumor was dead. It had infarcted, it had uh, um, swelling. swollen, and the brain was all being compressed. So that made me think twice about it. The only thing we don't see nowadays anymore with MRI scan, I had a whole, no, not a big series, but three cases where we had actually aneurysms on the meningeal artery wow. uh, going to the uh, to the meningeal flow aneurysms flow aneurysms uh, really yeah. of course yeah. but i remember that at, at that time then i i did the bone flap i started to drill the hole and i <clears> managed to exactly place the burr hole on that aneurysm so there was not an easy start of the surgery at that time but of course that that is manageable yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think we, if we have no sign of Professor Landiero, then I think we've probably reached the end of this, and I'll hand over to Nasser well, once again with great thanks for inviting all of us both to speak and, and to comment. Thank you, Nasser. Thank you. Thank you very much, my dear brother uh, Jenkin. We enjoyed the, the discussion. Thank you for moderating this session. At the end of this webinar, I'd like to thank all our distinguished speakers, moderators. Uh, the discussion was very interesting. All talks were very great. Uh, and thanks to organizing team Ahmad Magdi and uh, Hussam uh, yeah. Hassan Ali. I give the mic back to uh, Louis uh, Borba. Maybe he like to uh, say his closing remarks and he is going to close the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first off, to thank all the, the speaker, all the moderators, it was a great session. In ours, a great job of Professor Nasser. In more than 300 people that was online, and probably the people that we watch again in the next days. Thank you all. The discussion is still going on. Maybe many Joma will stay time and time, days and days discussion. It's our passion. You have too much to improve. I think soon you will have more about meningioma in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. And have a nice weekend for all of you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. You too. Thank Happy you. weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye. Bye.
Thank you.